Honda. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, Representative Head is at a meeting right now. She should be back soon. Um, Representative Gonzalez is taking this meeting outside. Uh, Representative Strong should be with us presently, um, as should Representative Christie. Good morning, Commissioner. How are you? Good morning, Representative. I'm fine. How are you? Good. Welcome back. Thank you. Um, do you know everybody here? I do. Do you I, know Ed Reed? Uh, hi. hi, Lindsay Curley. Ed Reed. Nice, nice to, meet to meet you. It was appointed this year to replace uh, Representative Gresham. Great. My life has never been the same. <laughs> Mine neither. <laughs> or not since you were reporting, since I was. <laughs> Do you refer to it as irreparable damage? Oh. <laughs> we will talk off the record. <laughs> so That's we're, great. Um, we're here to talk about S40, which is an act related to increasing the minimum wage and um, uh, rules of the house if people other um, please you know, just when we do at open up conversation or have open conversation or references or questions please remember to identify yourself for the record before you start speaking and um, the witnesses don't uh, have to do that um, but please share with us some I mean I imagine you have an opening statement to work with and then we can and then we can go into questions and facts sure so for the record I'm Lindsay Curley Commissioner of Labor and I have with me today uh, Matthew Berwitz, Economic and Labor Market Information Chief for the Vermont Department of Labor. Good morning. That's a mouthful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just got that down, though. So I want to thank you for having us here today. Um, uh, Matt will explain to you that he was involved in the study committee, although uh, wasn't necessarily um, asked to to provide comment on, on the uh, the study and, and what they were speaking of during the during the study period, but. Um, I'll just put right up front that, you know, we certainly um, don't disagree with the intent of the minimum wage pr proposal. That being said, I will just clarify that the administration is not in favor of doing this increase at this time. Um, I really want to let Matt speak to that because it's um, economics behind it that, that I think uh, explain why we're where we're at. So, Matt, okay. take it away. Good morning. Um, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm here to share just general observations um, about the minimum wage, answer questions. As Representative Stevens indicated, I'm sure there'll be questions and discussions. Um, this particular conversation is a challenge to me. Um, one, because of time. We have potentially an hour. Um, and the avenues of which we could take this discussion, whether it's economic theory, whether it's current economic conditions, or whether it's outside the realm of economics, could fill that hour, no problem. Concepts, stories, everything. So this idea of this quick discussion, I'll do my best to, to um, speak slow so that I'm not rushing, because I have mental overload when the concept of minimum wage uh, is introduced. I've been practicing <laughs> economics as a professional for uh, going on 13 years now. I have a master's degree in economics. And one of the things that is in nearly two decades of studying minimum wage is that there is nothing that is conclusive out there to my satisfaction that indicates if you do X, Y will occur. And discussion today, I hope will kind of illuminate some of what I think to be the fuzzy points around what minimum wage and what minimum wage doesn't do from an economic standpoint. Stepping aside clearly that this is also a political discussion, this is also a social discussion, there's many aspects to this conversation. So I'm speakly, solely speaking as the role of an economist, the role of the economist I take very seriously, um, and that means that my role is here to provide information. I'm not here to tell you what to do, I am not a politically appointed position, um, I was, uh, I've been through three governors, so this is my third governor. Um, the administration has a perspective, and, and Commissioner Curley is here to share the administration's perspective. I'm here to provide information to help you make a decision because you have a decision in front of you. Um, as the commissioner indicated, I was a uh, labor's staff person to the summer study committee on minimum wage. I did not have the opportunity to participate that, in that summer study committee in an active way, but I was witness to uh, the discussions that took place. From seeing that discussion, from seeing the end workplace or work product, um, certainly want to commend the summer study committee for the work they did. Um, I do feel that there was one particular question that was left unasked. Much of the summer study committee's focus was on what will happen if we raise the minimum wage this way. 
what question was not asked is what has happened since we've increased the minimum wage the last three, four, or five times? Because we are currently operating under a legislative past minimum wage um, that has increased the minimum wage over the last three, four years. And my question, and I have as many questions probably as you do, uh, about the intent of this uh, bill, because as the commissioner said, we certainly, I think the spirit behind the, the bill is one we can all get behind it. We'd love to see the well-being of Vermonters improved, but if this minimum wage bill is meant to tackle affordability, if it's meant to tackle poverty, well, we have data, we have discussions from our recent past of other states and counterparts that indicate those linkages are not clear. 50% of people under the federal poverty, uh, federal, poverty, federal poverty line do not have any income at all. So no W-2 income. So if we raise the minimum wage, that will not impact those individuals. So nonetheless, if we are trying to improve the well-being of individuals living in poverty, we need to come up with another strategy for the whole other 50% of that population. In addition, what I'm seeing, and we can, this is where I can either go into the theoretical or I can go into the practical realities of what we've seen in the last few years. The Vermont economy has benefited from a massive U.S. economic expansion since 2010. We've had robust economic growth from the standpoint of duration, not in terms of absolute growth. But over time, we have creeped back and slowly improved. Um, and as a country, we are better than where we were in 2007. But that is not the case for all parts of the country. And that's not even the case in all parts of Vermont. Uh, I'm not sure how many people saw the last press release that was released Friday um, from the Vermont Department of Labor, but there are indications in there that there are structural stress starting to show on this current economic expansion. So I find it, you know, there's a lot of talk in the Summer Study Committee about getting to this 1968 equivalent of the minimum wage. Well, in 1969, there was a recession. And so if we are at that point again where we're looking around saying, oh, 2018 looks great, we could be facing another recession, and I'm not saying we will, but in the next six months, one year, two years, we're already reaching the second longest economic expansion in U.S. history. Vermont is not an economic island in that we are subject to the U.S. headwinds. So the one thing that has concerned me most, and I can certainly pass these around or just use it as an illustration, but um, this economic recovery has been urban-based across the country. The biggest <coughs> urban areas have seen the greatest economic gains. Rural parts of America across the country have not seen their economic prosperity increase. Um, and when we look at Vermont, it's no different. We used to talk a lot about how, I'll just hold this up for the standpoint of entertainment. For, we used to talk about the purple line being Burlington doing so, being so successful, and the red line being the rest of the state if you take Burlington out. We just recently rebenched marked our 2017 data, meaning we put out a monthly estimate, then we go back a year later and true it up. We found out that the rest of the state, meaning not including the Burlington labor market area, which includes some of Franklin County, some of Addison County. Would you like me to just pass these out? Do you have them on the left one? Um, I do not. I can use yeah, I might have lost mine, too. Oh, here. No, I got one. Got one? OK. Oops, sorry. Are you going to have other things? Um, I don't know what's already in record from my previous discussion. Nothing? Oh, okay. I didn't know how the documents counted. Sorry. Um, so when we re-benchmarked and re-looked at 2017, the area of the state that does not include Burlington, labor market area, which includes some of Franklin County, some of Addison County, basically over to Waterbury in the northwest corner of the economic hub, um, the rest of the state we thought was getting back to where it was in 2007. When we went back and looked at it, you can see that the red line is barely, is not even getting back to the zero line from where we were in 2007. So if you remove the Burlington labor market area from the, United, from the Vermont economy, the rest of the state in 10 years is not back to where it was in 2007 as a whole. There's pockets that are going to be up, and there's going to be pockets that are down. Now, if we look at this last release of the Burlington labor market area, you see the purple line taking a sharp decline. And that's what was included in the last press release, indicating that Burlington labor market area as an area is now over the year down. Our largest economic engine, current estimates indicate, is down 1,200 jobs from the previous year. 
So as an indication of the well-being and economic health of the state of Vermont, we're starting to see signs of stress. And I'm not saying, again, I'm repeating, I'm not saying there's going to be a recession today or tomorrow. I'm saying we're seeing an indication that there could be stress, as this is the second longest economic expansion in US history, that we could be facing something. It could, we could plateau off and then skyrocket up. This economic engine could find more fuel to keep going. But we have indications right now that that is not um, happening. Um, hi. Sorry, Matt. Um, this, I guess I'm trying to understand this, this document in oh, relation sure. to what you just said. Mm -hmm. This has nothing to do with what you just said about jobs now. Yeah, sorry, I didn't give very much reader guidance. Again, I'm worried about time already. Um, Let's, so. <laughs> I'm just wondering if you have any, um, if, if, if the support, if you have information about those, about the current situation as well. But yeah, give us some guidance to this. Sure. And so left to right is time, so it's months. Up and down is percent job loss. <coughs> and so what this is is a benchmark data point starting in December 2007, the last economic peak, and says what happens from 2007 and we put it in percentage terms so that we can look and see relative to each other, relative around the zero line, are we gaining, meaning above zero, or losing relative to December 2007, the last peak. And so when we hit the recession, we, we, the state did very, uh, had a very tough time. The US economy, the blue line drops down to losing six out of every 100 jobs, significant recession. In Vermont, the green line, we lost four out of every 100 jobs in the US economy, or in the Vermont economy. When we separate the green line into the purple line and the red line, you get this two parts of the state. The Burlington labor market area, which accounts for about one third of the population and 40% of the business activity. And you get the rest of the state, or the balance of the state, which is the red line. So this red line is everything outside of the Burlington area through to December 2017? Yes. Yes. OK. That is illustrative. Thank you. Tommy? It strikes me that you're showing one metric here jobs, number of jobs, Yes. but how does that relate to unemployment? Uh, that's a great question. I would love to see the trend line for that. Sure, I don't have that with me. The unemployment rate is low. Um, we have one of the lowest unemployment rates in the country. Um, we are experiencing downward pressure, uh, pressure on our labor force. Um, so labor, the labor market right now is tight. Um, as it relates to um, uh, that trend line, it would look similar, except it would go the other way. The, risk, the unemployment rate would get high during the recession and drop down. So we're at about just under 3% right now. Um, I will talk a little bit about the, the household outcomes. So I think one thing that I think you'll hear in these discussions. I just have one more question about the methodology here. Um, sure. So a year ago, if you were sitting here a year ago talking about the same, these same statistics, mm -hmm. You would have had, you would have been truing up 2016 numbers mm -hmm. and then making an estimate of 2017 numbers. Mm -hmm. um, how? So now we have. So you have. A, if you have an estimate from 2017, and now you've trued it up, mm -hmm. what was the difference? Uh, we were overestimating in certain months by anywhere from two to three thousand jobs. Um, and it should be noted, there was a recent article by Art Wolf in the Berlin Free Press on this. The Vermont Department of Labor is a partner to the federal government's Bureau of Labor Statistics. Our ability to influence the Bureau of Labor Statistics methodology is nil. So this is coming from DCs, their methodology, their definitions, right. their and then, survey. And then it's trued up to what you get from your own numbers. So you're using you're using uh, U.S. methodology, but then you go back a year later to find out what the actual numbers are. Right. So I'm just, I just want to point out while we're having this larger conversation that we make policy based on estimates that are provided to us from government mm -hmm. um, and to do our work, mm -hmm. part of our research. And so it's just an interesting concept now to go back to real numbers that were pretty accurate last year as estimates, and now we're finding out that they're not. You know, so does that mean our policy was wrong a year ago? Did we go into making policy wrong a year ago? And how should we adjust that? How should we, how should we adjust that now? I just that's that's a that's a um, methodology gap that I'm going to struggle to get across. Yeah, and I would love your feedback so that I can share it with my federal partners because we've expressed our concerns about this. Um, 
to your point, the specific question, no, I don't think it would materially influence the conversations last year because the general trend line was the same, even though there might have been a little bit of overestimating, the positive line was still there. What we're seeing now is we could be facing a turning point. And if we are facing a turning point, these surveys are have um, a tougher time catching turning points. And that's what we're potentially seeing. When we went back and we said, OK, we were a little hot, but when we brought it back down, it actually crossed the zero line. So we were there were slightly overestimations both in the Burlington area and in the rest of the state of Vermont. And so that's what's brought them both down, pulling the state still below zero line, and then the Burlington showing over the year job loss. And when you talk about losing 1,200 jobs, which jobs are they? We are currently investigating that. This is new information as of uh, Friday. So we are working with our federal partners to better understand what these are. At the sub-state level, we don't have as much detail as we do at the statewide. And so we're trying to dig in to understand better what's happening in the Burlington labor market. So this is all emerging. All right. So when we say, again, when we say we lost 1,200 jobs last year, when there's a headline that says we lost 1,200 jobs. In the Burlington labor market in area. In the Burlington yep. labor market area. We don't know if we lost 1,200 banking jobs, 1,200 waiting jobs, uh, you know, uh, service jobs, or middle okay. class. You know, we don't know anything about what those jobs are. We just have numbers. At this time, yes. OK. Thanks. That's I have. Brian and then Rep uh, Representative Smith and then Representative Walsh. Do you think that perhaps uh, some of the job losses are due to contractors uh, laying off the winter type of thing? Or do you take that into consideration? Uh, yeah, that would be taken into consideration because we do uh, take into account the seasonal variability of certain industries. So we know construction, we know leisure and hospitality of certain patterns. Paving companies and things like that yep. lay off in the winter. Yep. Okay. I'm, something that was helpful to me, just to clarify, is when we talk about jobs that are lost, it's not that we don't have jobs, it's not that jobs are going away. That number is reported as people that are filling those jobs. So I don't, I didn't want, I, for me, I just wanted to clarify that it's not that companies are just wiping jobs away at this point. <laughs> In theory, right, because the, to, to add on that, because um, the, these are a count of people on payroll. It's possible there's 1,200 open positions that weren't there last year and that Burlington is just having difficulty recruiting. Which is to bring us back to this conversation, um, as an economist, what we're trained is to allow the market to take signals. So there, if there is a labor shortage in Burlington, Burlington employers would take that cue and raise their wages to attract talent. And so what concerns me is that um, a minimum wage is a blanket change to the prices of labor. And price control is not something that economists are typically very comfortable with. Um, and for those, just to piggyback it, I see a lot of similarities in the discussions right now about starting a trade war. When the United States announces we're going to enact tariffs on certain countries, what they're talking about is reducing competition and increasing prices. And in many ways, Vermont, as a small island, would be signaling that we're going to increase prices and we are going to try and, but the United States economy has enough diversity to be self-sufficient. If we ended up closing all our borders, we probably could provide for much. Our diamond supply would probably run short. Um, we probably would do well for energy for a while, but there are certain things we do import technology-wise. We'd probably go back to bigger cars because we like to design them that way here. Um, but uh, there's no indication by Vermont as it can't go it alone, so to speak. So in sense, in sense like um, I've thought about this as it can be considered um, akin to that because through discussions, I think you'll hear that there's no dispute that this potentially would reduce the number of jobs in the state of Vermont. That's what you hear. There's potential job loss for this proposal. So then the question is, what goes back is like, is there potential income increases for the individuals who keep their jobs? I also have indications to say that there's some questions about that. Specifically, there's two different, and this is two different sources. One from businesses saying how many hours people are working, and the other one is from households, from individuals saying how much they're working. And in both those surveys, um, employers in the private sector over the last, and I have the data right here, um, they've gone down, the average weekly hours in private Vermont employers that work by employees has gone down to one hour. So it was 34.4 hours, now it's 33.4 hours. So they've lost one hour in the, since 2008, 2016. So there's been a decrease in the number of hours worked. My fear is, is that concentration of average weekly hours is concentrated to the individuals who are the lowest skills. You know, if you're a full-time worker, a high professional, you're not getting your hours trimmed from 40 to 38 
or from 38 to 35. It's the people working 35 that are going down to 29. And so, I'm, I'm sorry, we had two questions. Oh, sure. We're going to make getting through your hour really difficult. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> yeah. I just, yeah. Representative Walls. I'm sorry, I want to go back to the chart. Oh, sure. Uh, first of all, uh, Burlington, I am assuming that means greater Burlington area. I mean, what kind of area is that? Sure, the Burlington, South Burlington labor market area includes much of Franklin County. Actually, now with the redefinition, it goes all the way up into Swanton. Um, oh, and wow. then, um, <laughs> Uh, Northern Addison County, um, but then Waterbury is kind of just nestles in there. Basically, Greater Chittenden County area. Okay, which leads to my next question: What percentage of the job market is that? It's about forty percent. Okay, thank you. Representative, I just wanted to make sure that I have this right. You said that there was twelve hundred uh, net job loss in the Burlington area, but it's that companies are reporting that many less people on payroll, but it's not necessarily the jobs are gone, they could be vacant. Mm -hmm. Does that include public employers as well? Yes, it's by place of res uh, by place of employment, that data. So where the employer is located. And so, you know, there's a, this is where it is a lot of information, even for me, who's looked at this for going on two decades now, just trying to understand what the impacts of minimum wage are, because um, the when we look at how employers are going to react, the money has got to come from somewhere. And employers are going to respond. And some ways that employers can respond is reducing hours, um, increasing or adopting new technology, um, and when the the technology piece can be. I think that's one of the things that I think causes most people pause is we don't know how technology will change. Small employers are not as equipped as large employers to handle this. Granted, I will be the first to agree, in the short run, this will have less effect. But in the long run, employers are going to start making decisions. There are currently, I've had, I, I like to talk to employers to see what they think. You know, they say how they would change their business model or potentially increase prices. But when you start talking to larger employers, they'll, they'll say, well, there's certain divisions that right now it's not even financially attractive to keep them in Vermont. We could outsource them. We could you know, relocate certain arms or operations, the specialization, the future of where our economy goes. Um, and as the prices change, that, that decision gets tougher and tougher. And so how technology is used, how outsourcing or other labor sources is used um, is a big concern. Because when I talked about the employer saying that people in the private sector are working less, when we ask people in Vermont households, there is a disproportionately higher number of people who say, I want to work full time, but all I can get is part time work. And so again, there's an indication not only from the businesses, but from households of Vermonters saying, I would take more hours, but I can't get more hours right now. And I have a fear that, you know, as these smaller companies have less flexibility in dealing with some of these changes. Larger companies, you know, larger retailers specifically, they can invest in software that will actually shorten the shift. If they used to have four hour shifts, they'll now have sh shifts that are three hours because they realize there's only this peak hour. They have softwares that predict customer uh, demands. So to the minute that they have actually more now on call workers, you know, we've already seen the, uh, the incorporation of self checkouts. At, uh, and and the, all of this is just how large employers can adapt to this world. Small employers don't have the luxury of you know, getting a, a, a software model to predict when their customers are going here or do self-checkouts if they are the only one in the office. So, so on that, that has still has little to do or a lesser percentage to do with wages. I mean, a large corporation is gonna that that isn't headquartered here is gonna invest in software because they believe, whether it's based on numbers or on policy, that human capital costs too much. And if I'm a person who wants more hours, but I can't find them because my job at a retailer said, well, I'm gonna only limit you to 28 hours because then I have to pay for your health care. I have to put you into health care. I mean, those are decisions that are made above and beyond actual living conditions for those workers. Those are decisions that are made up top that come down below. So how do we address, and I, I guess this is policy, so how do we address the fact that these workers can't find more hours? Whose fault is that? Is that their fault or is it the, the culture's fault? Um, until we know where these jobs are, 
but how do we know who's going to survive in Vermont on any wage? And, and if, we, and if the job market's this tight, mm -hmm. if the job market is this tight, if there's 1,200 openings, however, whatever those 1,200 jobs are, whether they're openings or whether they're jobs of positions that have been made obsolete through technology, I mean, that's a category that could be in that 1,200. Um, what, what do you say to those people if you're, if, if you're not able to provide them with work yeah. And then we want to provide jobs mm -hmm. that stay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would just, I'll yeah. turn it over to the commissioner. I'll give you a side by I'll Yeah, that's fine. <laughs> the, um, I think the, all fair points. And the one variable in there that may be held constant in that discussion is human capital. And I think that is very much a variable. How do you increase the skill set of the individuals to the jobs that are available? When you talk to employers, they'll say, I'll hire someone at this, but as soon as they can demonstrate they can show up on time and work well with others, I can give them three other tasks, give them more responsibility, give them more accountability, and allow them to earn more money. But it's this idea of human capital. Yeah, I was just going to say, as a former uh, employer where we hired people who would be in um, entry-level jobs, cashiers, um, we as a business, you know, we knew what we we knew what we had to spend, and as somebody really showed their value, we were more than happy to keep bumping them up. Um, but we also had the pressure of as we add different, you know, costs like you have to provide health care and you have, you know, the, the wonderful things that we give them. Our budgets get tighter unless we start increasing our costs, obviously. And so, as uh, Matt said, what we saw happen was we started cutting their hours because. We could, you know, we only had so much money to work with, and so we started cutting their hours. So it didn't, in the end, help our employees necessarily because we're shrinking what they're taking overall, what they're earning because their hours have been reduced. So I mean, I think that's like a big fear of mine in particular is that you know we want to give equal energy certainly to the to the employees and the employers, but Vermont is so full of small businesses <coughs> and increasing minimum wage as it's as it's proposed, um, if if we had ten employees and we you know had to pay them an extra five dollars an hour over their full time, it would cost our business a hundred thousand dollars a year. Now, in a small bit, I can tell you there's there's not even an extra ten. You know what I mean? So I just worry that the people that are that are providing the jobs are ultimately the ones that are going to pull back and stop. You know, filling those because it's too difficult. It's too much of a strain. And right now, where we have such a low unemployment rate, and as Matt said, econ um, the economy is forcing a business if they really want to hire somebody, they have to up the ante on their own. They have to make that decision on their own, really, to entice people. So, and what it's worth. Yeah, <laughs> and this it kind of takes us back into the theoretical standpoint of to the statement I said before: the money's got to come from somewhere. And in fact, like if this was the proposal was designed to cure wage inequality or something, say that was a concern of yours and you thought by raising the minimum wage, wage inequality would go down. When you look at the states across the nation that have higher minimum wages or the federally minimum, there's no correlation in my mind about which states are doing better with their minimum wage laws. Look at New Hampshire, for example. But from a wage inequality standpoint, when the money's going to come from somewhere, say it comes from the pockets of business owners, which could be... Um, um, the goal or just the outcome, the risk profile for that individual has changed anyway. And so they're not going to accept more risk as a business owner saying, well, now I'm going to increase my wages. Then they're going to have to subsequently offset their own personal choices and risk. And therefore, we're, we're pushing everything in the same way. So by changing the prices, um, which is, again, what uh, wages are, it's the price of labor, um, I don't see us moving the needle towards poverty. You know, the, in the last four years, we raised the minimum wage. Last year's poverty statistics show that Vermont went up. So, um, you know, the, you know, the, I just, I don't see. I'm looking for evidence of like, okay, what, what will happen? And I just, I'm not seeing it. So you said earlier that it, the question that was unasked was, well, what happened? Mm -hmm. um, we had a. Question. Representative Fields had a great question last week of saying, "Well, five years ago we've had we had this conversation mm -hmm. when it was 873, and mm -hmm. we asked everybody for estimates yeah. on what it would look like to go to 1050 in four years. 
do you still have those estimates and can you compare them to actually what happened? And does that inform your decision about how you make variables and how you make algorithms to decide what these numbers are going to be? That's a, that's a great question. Unfortunately, it's not best directed at me. It would be best directed at the economist who did the analysis back in whenever that legislation was passed. And I believe that was Tom Kovett, who you'll be hearing from. Um, but to that question, there was discussion that you know, the cost of human services for state government would go down because people are going to be earning wages. Have we seen that manifest in state government? So, you know, there's other signs that I'm looking for. Has incomes increased? Has poverty gone down? Has wage inequality decreased? Has affordability changed? You know, I think about affordability as a big pot half full of boiling water, and you're worried about the boiling water, so you add a cup of cold water. That's temporarily going to help your situation. But the more you add cold water, you, the conditions of the pot haven't changed, and now it's getting more volatile because your, your pot is filling up with water and it's still boiling. It cools it down for a second, but then it's coming back because of the same conditions. And changing the prices of labor are going to increase the prices of goods and services across the state. And the indication that um, these people that are increasing their wages are going to spend their money in the Vermont economy are true. But the things that you spend your money on, especially in the lower income brackets, are fuel, transportation costs, utilities, food, clothing. Many of those things, especially if you're in a lower income bracket, are not going to be affordable with the stamp Vermont made on it. I applaud anyone who supports it, but you know what? But when you're making those choices, if you were on a tight budget, you know, you have to make those decisions. And so the economic leakage is associated with the typical consumption patterns of individuals in lower income quintiles are going to be economic leakages for the state. Representative Wong. So I'd like to follow up on your question. And, and that would be wonderful to see based on this last debate from 873 to 1050. What has happened to consumption? Mm -hmm. That would be nice to know. That's a great question. Yeah, so if you could find that, uh, and what has happened to productivity, mm -hmm. and what has happened to the state's uh, gross product. I forget what it's yeah. called by state. What are those other indicators, not just the numbers of jobs? But I want to add one more thing. I struggle a little bit with the logic of employers constantly decreasing the number of hours at work because there is a critical mass mm -hmm. in which you can't perform your, your services mm -hmm. if you go below that. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which I see cuts both directions. Yeah. It does? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. It, you know, if you don't have enough cashiers or if you don't have enough people making the beds in your hotel, mm -hmm and you're not going to be doing the services, ultimately the burden comes on the consumer. There's no question about that. Yeah. And so I would like to see a correlation. What I'm looking for is more trends and mm -hmm. what has actually happened yeah. in, the, in the past. And these are all fair questions. And I think, um, mm -hmm. and this is the challenge, right? And so we had a summer study committee. Did they, they did a great job in answering the questions that were raised, but there are many questions regarding consumption that were not answered. There was many questions regarding what is the historical performance of Vermont been over these last five years. Um, you know, and so those were just questions not answered. Um, but as it relates to you know, wages and, um, and wage inequality, there are individuals that are going to benefit from the technological revolution, and there's going to be individuals, you know, the job winners and the job losers, or income winners and income losers based on this. Um, and so there are certainly opportunities to continue to grow. And the people who benefit, when you talk about productivity, it's the higher income levels now that are benefiting most from productivity advances. Just because a, a computer processor can get an extra 100th millimeter, I don't know what it might be, but a computer processor goes a little bit faster, that's benefiting finance, right? That's benefiting high rapid transactions. It's not benefiting the cashier on the front line. Their benefit came in the 1960s, whenever the cash register was invented, and then their benefit came in the 80s when they invented the scanner. The frontline staff are not receiving the benefit of technological advances right now. They're actually feeling the direct competition of technology. And it's the people skilled enough to be able to leverage it. That's why wage data right now is so tough to understand, because the way some people are getting 10, 15% raises year over year because of their productivity increases, because of their value to their company, because they're able to leverage the technology that's there to make the bottom line for their company grow. But that's not 
the everyday Vermonter on the front line saying, I'm here to help you, I'm here to support. It's very tough. So one more, I think just one more question that I have on this chart. Um, <coughs> this chart starts in December of seven and everybody, oh, yes. everybody's given a, 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 the same value, basically, yep. on that chart. A recession yeah. begins, what happens? So, so the United States drops 6% mm -hmm. in two years. Yep. Um, since then, it's gone up 6% and changed. Does that mean it's the same? Num does the mean number of jobs go back to what that zero number is then? Is it? Uh, it, it pretty much, except you get the, um, the order operations problem. Like if you ever had a 10% loss in your retirement account, you get 10% back, you're still under, you know what I mean? Sure. Because so 10% technically, 10 down always hurts harder than 10% going so up. So technically, we're still all behind from what we were in the... In the yeah, I think the U.S. is um, probably right back to right there. I think I saw that announcement. But again, there's certain pockets of the country that are not. This is, That's a universal blank. And traditionally, Vermont has never... Well, it has gone, but it always goes at a lesser curve. Doesn't get too high, doesn't get too low when we have these booms and busts. Yep. So, in the end, what does that mean for the green line? I mean, it's, it means that, I mean, to me, it looks like it's somewhat sluggish, mm -hmm. but not so different from traditional curves. And I just, and I don't see any traditional curves on this chart. So, yeah, the, um, you know, it, uh, we are back above the employment level where we were in 2007. Um, oh, and to answer your question, the, actually, I got confused about that 6% down, 6% up. The 6% down would have taken you to the blue line at the bottom of the recession. The 6% up would have taken you to the zero line, and now there's 6% beyond the zero line. So it's 12%. Okay. Yeah, so they've kind of, you know, down 6, up 12. So they are, the U.S. as a whole is um, well above the employment levels. Um, and as you said, you know, I've talked about that in the past, where the Vermont economy is quite diversified, actually. People don't think about the Vermont economy as diversified. But we have a higher concentration of manufacturing employment in the state of Vermont than the U.S. does overall. Um, we have a higher concentration of government workers, some of that in part to our um, public education, but a good part of it also has to do with the federal government and the border that we share. Um, so, um, and uh, then we still have leisure and hospitality, we still have um, agriculture, professional business, technical service. So we have that a little bit more diversification, healthcare, private education, um, gives us a little bit more. But the green line, which you described as sluggish, you know, economic growth, traditional economic growth theory, and again, I'm not saying that this is the, the end all be all or the lens that everyone should fine tune their sight towards, but traditional economic growth says it comes from only a couple of places. One, natural resources. How are we going to use our natural resources differently, or are we going to find some that we didn't know existed? Two, technological advances, which is again going to productivity and how can we benefit from um, increase in productivity due to technology so that the standard of living of all can increase. And then three is population growth. If you want to grow an economy, you grow the population. That's you know, one of the traditional metrics of um, uh, economic growth. And for the state of Vermont, we have not been growing the population. So our population is very stagnant. So I think this green line that's since kind of plateaued since January or April 15, 2015 in this graph, it kind of mirrors our population in many ways. It's just like we've been flat. And the last, indicate, uh, the last estimate by the census actually shows it's going down, which is the first decline in a while. But hopefully that's just a spot estimate that gets further revisions. Thank you. So um, without additional questions, I could continue. I have another. I could talk just differently about um, what this graph is. I think, Ron, did I give you this one too as well? Yes. OK. Um, Um, so as the Department of Labor, we service all Vermonters, and we're um, happy to work with employers and employees alike. Um, and so what we have here is kind of a, a really rough depiction of what I consider to be the labor market, where you have the cello-shaped figure representing labor supply, where we have a concentration of individuals at the top that actually have higher skills than potentially are necessary in the labor market. You can think about, like, if you have a PhD in philosophy, if you are not uh, a professional philosopher or a PhD <laughs> or, um, or teaching philosophy, perhaps your PhD in philosophy is skills beyond what outside the labor market would seek, right? 
And we also have a, a wide body at the bottom of a lower skill, you know, individuals who haven't gone on to complete a, a bachelor's degree, maybe not even complete a post-secondary education, lots of opportunities within there. Um, the diamond represents the traditional staffing pattern of an employer, where you know, however we change the economy, at the end of the day, there's always going to be one owner, or typically one owner, and then they have their core of middle management or professional expertise, their lawyer, their HR personnel, and then you have middle management, and then you have frontline staff, and you're always going to have more ditch diggers than foremen, you know, on the job site. So what this represents is how the the staffing pyramid demanded or requested by employers um, are hiring. And what worries me is part E, and that's why I just want to kind of highlight, because the Department of Labor, we work with individuals. There are individuals in the Vermont economy right now that cannot get employed at $10 an hour because of either whether it was barriers to entry, um, skill deficits, um, a myriad of reasons. What minimum wage does in my mind is actually just raises this bar up. The bottom line moves up saying, because there's a price. There has to be, for an employer, there has to be a, a return to the investment of wages. Do you, so we're so potentially increasing. Yeah. Um, do you mean, you mean um, the one where that E is pointing to gets bigger, the, the part line. of the yellow mm -hmm. gets larger? Yeah, because so you're going to move the red line. The red line, line goes up, mm -hmm. and then those below, OK. Because employers are going to be faced with those choices that we discussed earlier. How am I going to deal with the changing in labor costs? Is it through reduced hours? Is it through fewer staff? Is it through new technologies? Is it through shorter business hours? Is it through price increases? And to the ones who can pass on prices successfully, that's what they'll do. But others who are in a much more competitive environment, you think about small retail, who's now competing with the, the global market, um, uh, there is going to be some challenges, but when I think about the the people, because that's what we work with, and I'm exposed to all the time, is like we're trying to get, um, we're trying to advocate and champion individuals to get them employed, and they're having difficulty locking down a ten dollar an hour job, and and now ten fifty, and a change in the minimum wage makes this population in a, you know, I worry again that we're going to be separating. The, the population and the, the people who are, are able to succeed and the people are not, and we're going to be increasing the people who are not. And so this, you know, I'm not saying there's, I'm identifying areas that would need potential policy assistance from you. Like this is what I'm asking. There are going to be Vermonters who will not benefit from this change, potentially. Um, and those are individuals that would need assistance and some of the most critical in need as it stands now. that number at the very beginning, and I think this mm -hmm. is actually, um, I think what you're talking about here relates to what you said at the beginning about poverty um, and the number of people in poverty, or the percentage of people in poverty who have no income at all, so the minimum wage wouldn't help at all. Can you tell me what that number is again? Yeah, Art Wolf quotes it as a 50%. 50% that are of households below the federal poverty line have no W-2 income as it is. 50%. Mm -hmm. So, um, again, they might have... Very good reason for that. And they, they might have barriers to employment. Uh, they might right, have significant, yeah. um, well, and they are probably yeah, right, um, making ends meet in other ways. Um, and and along that line, making ends meet in other ways is that I think we, this is there's two things that also frighten me about the minimum wage um, changes. One, it'll increase. It, it is my belief that it'll increase the number of unpaid internships because um, you know which. Uh, something the Department of Labor does not believe in because you don't know how to create employment opportunities based on economic necessity or economic need. Oh, I can qualify for that free. Right, I can know. work for free, but right. the person next to me can't work for so, free, so they don't have that opportunity. Right, whatever. so yeah. unpaid internships, I believe, would be more common. Um, you know, and potentially they would offset it with like college courses or credits, but an income, a wage. Um, and uh, the underground economy. Representative Hill. Um, was that 50% of Vermonters below the federal poverty line? Yeah. Yes. Um, so in changing the, the incentives for the underground economy or, you know, challenging the new modern definitions of, like, the gig economy and figuring out how we can separate the employee from the employer and, uh, through, through different means. Do we have a official definition of what 
underground economy is. Yeah. Illegal activity? <laughs> That's different from the gig economy, which the Bureau of Labor Statistics is going to be releasing their newest study on what's going on with <coughs> what they call the contingent workforce. But the underground economy is exactly that. The, they don't answer surveys very well. Um, so we don't. We don't. But, um, but I did live in France for a while, and they even have a word for it, which I thought was fascinating. Um, July 1st is coming, though. <laughs> Pot's going to be legal. Oh. Mm. So as an economist, I guess if I was just going to wrap up to give you opportunities to conclude, I think um, anyone who remembers their first job and starting minimum wage, potentially, and that first increase in your wage, your first raise, that's an important market signal that young people or people new to a career take and they build off of. Wage compression will dilute the ability of employers to have the sensitivity to award certain individuals higher wages because of performance. And it's diluting a market signal that is a key market signal in my belief that more skills, better professional attitude, or better professionalism will lead to higher wages. And as we compress it, as it gets more challenging on the front line to distinguish who's in charge and who's not because of um, changes to price of labor, I think that's an important signal that's lost on young people as they build their professional acumen. One question we had last week as we were starting to take testimony and um, the question was kind of punted to labor, um, was there's a, there's a discussion or an argument that if, um, if I raise my wages up to a certain level, then the people who formerly made it up to that level based on the old levels I'll have to raise their their income up that high. So in this last five years since we've seen the increase, do, do we have the ability to, 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 to find out what happened? Did, did those salaries indeed go up from if I was, when, when minimum wage was 873 an hour and I was making $11 an hour, um, now that it's 1050 an hour, did my wages go up to 1450 simply because of that or because I've been there for five years, whatever? Mm -hmm. Can you determine how much more salary is being paid out at a level higher than the minimum wage than was um, but, you know, what, what it compares to five years ago? That's a great question, and it would be a um, pretty significant research task, but it's a question that, as to my knowledge, has not been asked and therefore has not been researched. So I don't know what has occurred on that front. Yeah, we heard that Washington State can break down hours because they, they, rose their, they, ride, they, they rose their income, their minimum wage so high so quickly, uh, they, or so quickly. And then, um, but they, do, they can break it down by hours, but we yep. can't. Is that yep. right? Uh, I know my counterpart in Washington, and the reason is is because their, um, their formula for calculating unemployment insurance benefits requires that information to be collected. Our calculation does not require that information to be collected, so we do not collect it. They're one of the few states that has that. Any further questions for the commissioner or for um, Matt? 50 minutes. That was, <laughs> that was exceptionally helpful. Thank you. Really, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That was really informative. Thank you for having us. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Good to see you. All right, next up on our list we have Stephanie Yu from Public Access Institute. Ourselves to just, um, just a 
we'll let you know who we are. And, That'd be great. All right, and, and I'm Representative Tom Stevens, I'm Vice Chair. Uh, I represent Waterbury, Huntington, and Gilles Moore. And both of them. Okay. Helen had South Rowan. Mary, we'll go, we'll go the wrong way. <laughs> Mary Howard, Rutland City. Ed Reed, face them. Tommy Waltz, Berry City. Heidi Sherman Stowe. Brian Smith from Derby. Vicki Strong from Albany. And Deanna Gonzalez, who would, who would be here, is from Rolinski, and Coach Christie is from Hartford. So we're very geographically split up. Okay, well, I appreciate that. Um, so I don't, do I have the, the ability to click, or does somebody else have the ability to click? Mm -hmm. Oh, Mary, okay. So, um, so just to introduce myself here, um, I'm Stephanie Yu. I'm a policy analyst with Public Assets Institute, and we are um, a public policy think tank here in Montpelier. We're nonpartisan and nonprofit, um, but we, what we do is we look at uh, Vermont tax, fiscal, economic policy, uh, particularly through the lens of how it's affecting low and moderate income Vermonters. Um, we have counterparts in most other states, um, but we work here in Montpelier, and like I say, we look at state level fiscal policy, um, particularly through how it affects ordinary Vermonters. Um, and what we do is we spend a lot of time in some of the databases that Matt was just talking about, looking at jobs related stuff, BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics, Bureau of Economic Analysis, IRS information, census data, all that, all that fun stuff. Um, and so, and our goal is usually to kind of translate that information in a way that people can understand quickly. Um, you know, keeping it um, in chart format and, and looking at um, sort of ways that, to kind of distill that information down into something that's easily graspable, um, <coughs> more easily grasped. So, um, and part of why we do this is because we believe in what you passed in 2012, which is the purpose of the state budget, um, which is to address the needs of the people of Vermont in a way that advances human dignity and equity. Um, and that those spending and revenue policies should recognize every person's need for health, housing, dignified work, education, food, social security, and a healthy environment. So, um, and, and when we do this, we kind of, we go through regular reports. And so we do a monthly jobs report. So some of the jobs data that Matt was just talking about, when it's released monthly, we also look at it monthly and release a report on that. And then every year we also do our State of Working Vermont report. And that comes out at the end of the year. And it looks at a lot of census data, but also a lot of IRS data, and really looks at literally the state of working Vermont, or maybe more accurately, the state of working Vermonters. So looking at both sort of labor force, but also how that's affecting families and their ability to make ends meet. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about today comes from that. Um, I did, I just, um, I was taking notes on my phone just because it's crowded in here. So I just want to, I want to kind of raise, um, a little bit of a question in response to some of what Matt was saying, which is, I think a lot of what he was talking about was sort of concerns about sort of how the wage market works in general and what that looks like. And I think from my perspective, I would just take a slightly different approach to it, which is sort of the question of whether we should have a minimum wage at all. And so if the question is, if you believe that we should have a minimum wage, then the question becomes, what's the right level? And, and so is, are we due for an increase or not? Um, and so I think that's really sort of the focus of what I'm talking about um, today. So the, so my testimony today is really focused around three, three main points. First, that income inequality is rising in Vermont and that that's bad for Vermont and for um, the Vermont economy. Um, two, that there are many families in Vermont struggling to make ends meet, including many middle class families. And then three, that by any measure, the power, the buying power of the minimum wage is shrinking, and so we need to get it back to a livable wage as soon as possible. So this first slide, so some of, so a lot of these slides, these charts that you're going to see, come from the last two years of our reports, um, 2016 and 2017. Not everything is, not all data sources are updated annually. So some of this, we just, you know, we have the most recent data available, and that's what, where this comes from. So the first thing to note is that where economic growth has gone and who's benefiting from economic growth. So these, these particular, um, the reason that we have these time periods is those are the post-recession expansion periods. So as the ec economy is growing again after a recession, where is the, the economic growth going? And you can see that, so, so the red, the red uh, um, bar is the top 1% and the orange bar is the bottom 99%. So since 
about the 1970s, you see that the majority of economic growth has gone to um, the top 1% or a disproportionate share. There's only been a little, uh, a short period when it was actually more than 50% of growth was going to the very narrow top 1%. Um, and so you can pretty clearly see that trend that since the 70s, um, that income inequality has gotten worse. So uh, for the, and, and we know that the rec most recent actions in Washington are only gonna make this problem worse. So if you go to the next slide, then the, um, this kind of just gives you a perspective of what that means. So this is um, the top 5% of Vermonters earn 12 times as much as those in the bottom 20%, so almost $300,000 more a year. This is for a family of four, but that just gives you an idea of what we're talking about. Um, Representative Reed, um, thank okay. you. That, the uh, first, not that slide, but the first one, mm -hmm. there's that one period um, mm -hmm. with the, uh, 2001 to 2007, and then it looks like it corrects itself. So there, there's no up, updated data past 2012 on that. So 2012, so this is, that's right. This is the most recent period. So that's the beginning of the expansion of after the Great Recession, but we don't have anything more recent than that. But um, I think one of the issues, part of the reason that that's true is that in this particular period, it took the stock market longer to recover, which often is part of the income sources for people in the top 1%. It's not, you know, obviously it's not just wages that's contributing to their income. So that took a longer time to recover, so it was more depressed. But this is the most recent information that we have. Do you have an analysis of why there was that just that one time, 2001 to 2007? Where it went to 50%, you mean? Yeah. Um, the, like I say, there were a lot of factors. Um, I do think that at that particular time, um, like I say, a lot of it depends on sort of what the stock, mar stock market's doing because that is a big chunk of what the income is at um, for the top 1%. Um, so it just happened to get that high. You know, I think you can sort of clear, you can see that that trend since the 70s has been a bigger share is going to the top 1%. So going back to maybe the next slide, um, and then if, if you can go to the next slide, the um, so that pattern, so this is a little bit more recent information. So this goes through 2014, but what we were looking at was just what's the income growth for the top 1% and the bottom 99% post the Great Recession. So you can see pretty clearly that the top 1% income is back to growing much faster. Um, so uh, more than four times as fast as that for the bottom 99%. Uh, so, and then on the next slide. Um, so before you go though, oh, is, sure. that, is that annual? growth or is that just total? That's cumulative. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And that is adjusted for inflation. Um, so then I think this <coughs> is, uh, this also sort of gets to the same point, which is that um, for, uh, it, that it took much longer for low and middle income Vermonters to regain the ground that they had lost during the recession. So for people at the bottom, their wages dropped well, actually shrunk quite a bit. And that we've just now, just now, and this goes through 2015, just now sort of gotten back to where they were previous, prior to the recession. Um, and so this is, so that red line, bottom 20%, the, um, the sort of blue line is middle 20%, and then the top 5% of wages. So you can see they didn't have the same falling off during the Great Recession and then have, have grown much more quickly since then. They didn't have any fall off. I mean, right. The top 5% had, right. had growth. Right, it wasn't steady growth. You can sort of see what, what was happening there, but they didn't, they didn't get below where they had been, right? So that's a big difference. Um, so on the next slide, um, it, you know, this gets to median household income. So this is adjusted for inflation, and you can see it's been relatively flat over the last, uh, you know, 20 years, um, 30 years really. So uh, on the next one, and just to sort of make, really hammer this point home, um, again, this is average household income by income group and who's growing. And so this is between 2006 and 2016, the top 5% seller incomes grow by 42%, uh, the bottom 20 less than 6%. But I, I kind of want to—I want to put some numbers on this because I think the percentages we're trying to compare sort of the growth rates and to see who's growing faster. But I think in real dollar terms, this is really—you know—it gives you a sense of what we're talking about. So for the bottom 20%, that 5.8% growth was $700 a year. For the top 5%, that um, that 42% growth is $95,000 a year. So that's a pretty big difference. So a raise of $700 versus a raise of $95,000 for those at the top. 
Um, and again, just to acknowledge sort of what's happening in income, it's not all wages. This isn't all wage related. So income does include capital gains. So those people at the top, a lot of their income is coming from other sources other than wages. But for the bottom, like about 75% of households, they really only have wage income. That, that is their, their wages and income are pretty much the same thing. Um, but that is part of what drives that income inequality is that, those, that investment piece, that capital gains piece, those other sources other than the wages. Is, is that data available, that it would just be wages? And I, and I ask just because it makes it a lot more germane to, to the minimum wage. So this next slide, I hope, gets to so some of that. Before, I'm sorry, oh, before you go to the next slide, there's 20% or more missing here. Right. At the bottom 20, middle 20, right. top 20, where's everybody else? Right. So, so we go... Um, so we don't we didn't put them all. The chart starts to get pretty crowded, but it's a pretty steady in you know increase. There is some sort of ups and downs and volatilities in there, but it's pretty much the bottom grows slowly and the top grows the most quickly. Are, did, are there people missing from that from this chart though? Is right, there are the slices. Yeah. These are yeah. just the relatives. These are just the slices that you know we want to call your attention to. I mean, like I say, I, I can I can give you the rest of that information. Those sort of other quintiles, these, if you're interested. Are these Vermont numbers? These are all Vermont numbers. Vermont specific numbers. And do you, in in your information that you provide, do you break it down by tax department, we, we can find out how many people are in the top 5% or the middle 20 right. but And I can provide that too if that's useful. So, um, you know, so the, so obviously we're talking about, you know, these are quintiles, so that's 20% of households. But for, for your sort of information, you know, two-thirds of Vermonters, you know, those households, you're falling below that $75,000 in household income. So that kind of gives you a ballpark Great. of what we're talking about. Thank you. Um, so on the next slide, this gets to, I hope this gets to your question, um, about wage, uh, wage Sorry, growth. Um, <laughs> um, you know, so again, the, that, that unearned, in, unearned income piece really does put a lot of that sort of top 1%, top 20%, or even further up because it, they're getting this unearned income. But just on the wage piece, so, and again, a lot of the income stuff that we talk about a lot of times is household income. And so if it's household income, there may be one wage earner, there may be more than one wage earner. So when you see that sort of $300,000 number for household income, that may be one or more wage earners. Whereas the wages, when we talk about wages, we're usually talking about sort of a per person wage. Um, so this kind of gives you a better idea. So that's why when you start to talk about like the 90th percentile of wages, it's a much lower number than that 90th, 90th percentile of income. Um, but so this is wages. So if you look at the 10th percentile of, inc of wages versus the 80th percent of uh, the 90th percentile, which is that greenish yellowish line, um, it's about $80,000 a year. Whereas at the at the bottom, you're talking about $20,000 a year in full-time wages at the 10th percentile. So, but but the other point again is sort of the way that they're growing. So the bottom is staying pretty flat. The 90th percentile is going up. So even when you take income, you know, unearned income out of the picture, you still see this disparate, disparate growth in the different groups. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Representative Walton. Uh, I would like to see the impact of inflation in that chart. So this is adjusted for inflation. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't read that. No, okay, no, no, no. you did do it. Okay. So that so that does account for that. So I think that's part of it. You know, so this is staying relatively flat. Um, and again, I would just point out that sort of the, you know, even if they're growing by a certain percentage, what that means at a low wage job is going to be significantly less than what it means at a higher wage job. Um, so we sort of want to balance how, you know, our comparisons um, with sort of the nominal dollars that, are, that uh, people have to spend. Um, so. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Representative Reed. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. do you, can you tell me or do you have a comparison with that or how it relates to the U.S. average? I can't. So Vermont generally is above the U.S. average in sort of wage and household income. There's some pieces where we are, not at all levels. So, so Vermont tends to have a smaller spread from top to bottom than a lot of states. You know, we're just we're a smaller state. There's not as much. You don't have these sort of hedge fund billionaires sort of stretching that top part out. Um, so. So we do have sort of smaller compression, but on average, our wages are higher. Our minimum wage is certainly higher than average. Um, so you know, there's, you know, 
but, but Vermont does tend to have a better educated workforce, which translates into, you would expect would translate into sort of higher average wages. Um, not always true, but um, they do tend to go together. So, so I think the, the main point from that slide is that this idea that increasing the minimum wage would in fact lead to a, more, a fairer distribution of the economic gains. So if all the economic gains are going to the top, then, the minimum, then lifting that minimum wage really does sort of force some of that, some of that um, economic gain down to the, to the bottom. Um, so, so from any angle, income inequality is really getting worse. Um, and that split spread is getting greater. And um, in fact, um, some of you may remember the Federal Reserve of Boston did a study in 2007 and found that Vermont had the second, second fastest, highest growing, second fastest growing income inequality um, in the country. So even though our spread is not as great, the rate at which it was getting further apart was faster. Um, and that's continued to be true. Yeah, sure. um, so can you, um, I realize that one of the stated goals of this is to reduce income inequality, but it was um, made clear by the economists that uh, there's no evidence that that would actually happen. I'd like you to address that. Do you, is there actually evidence that, that it reduces in income inequality? So, yeah. Well, I think there's no evidence that it doesn't. So I think there is evidence that it reduces income inequality. We can well, show we've increased minimum wage over the last four years, our income inequality has increased. Well, but the income inequality has been increasing for much longer than that. And I think part of the question is, how, by how much? Is it doing enough to, re to reduce income inequality? And I think that's part of the question. When we're talking, when we get to some of these measures in terms of livable wage, and the fact is that some of the increases that we've had in the minimum wage in the past haven't been sufficient to narrow that gap at all between what's a livable wage and so what it means actually means for people at the bottom. I think there's also this issue of, you know, we do have again, sort of a lot of those gains going to the, to the top, which is continuing to happen. Um, so we could get into a, you know, another a whole separate conversation on sort of the inc you know, income tax changes and what's been going on with that and in what ways that's contributing to the income inequality. So there's a lot of other factors at play beyond just the minimum wage, and I don't disagree with that at all. Strong. So when you're talking about changes um, from Washington, et cetera, mm -hmm. What I'm reading is more and more, almost every day, our ability for companies and businesses to give more wage to their earners, to their workers, and increase benefits because of this. So why am I hearing very different things? Where I'm hearing positive changes will improve people's quality of life and raise their incomes overall. Why am I hearing two things? Well, I guess some of it depends on who you ask. I do think that. Um, there's, there's a real question about what, when we talk about the federal tax changes in Washington, what's going to happen next? I think there's been a lot of signals that what's going to happen next is that the way to pay for this, for these, some of these tax cuts is um, that services will get cut. So that's one question. The other question that I would say is when we look at, so we've done, we've looked at, you know, there's been a number of um, groups that have done analysis of what those tax cuts will mean and where those tax cuts are going. Um, and there's pretty strong consensus that the vast majority of those tax cuts, so about two-thirds of the total tax cuts, are going to the top 20%. So that's increasing the income. Now, some of it's corporations, but the, the ultimately, I think, and, and Matt, I think, acknowledges this as well, is that you know, companies are always going to be looking to decrease the cost of labor. So you, know, you can talk about tax cuts and what that might look like and whether that there might be the ability to trickle down. And some companies may. There may be companies that choose to push those benefits down. But I think the goal is always going to be that there's this push to decrease the cost of labor. It tends to be the big, one of the biggest costs for businesses. So unless there's sort of a countervailing pressure to keep those wages up, you know, you're going to have this just moving in one direction. So I think part of the question is, you know, how this is going to play out individually. And, you know, this is a, the, these trends are sort of lots, of lots of individual businesses making these decisions. So each individual business may handle it differently. But the broader trend is that we're seeing that the vast majority of these benefits are going to the top. We, we've been told that there will be services that will get cut. You know, that Vermont, so Vermont's state budget, you all know this, is 35% federal revenue. You know, that pays for a lot of the programs that support Vermonters. So if that cut happens, you know, there's just, you know, so I think part of the question is what's happening at the federal level is sort of taking money from services for vulnerable people and bringing it up to the top you know, and giving it as tax cuts to the wealthy. Now, you know, I, I think you can argue the question. I think there is, um, you know, we were having this conversation the other day in, in, a, in a meeting where 
you can sort of argue the cart before the horse question, you know, do you need economic growth before you can sort of invest in people, or do you need to invest in people to get economic growth? And our argument would certainly be that you need to invest in people to have stronger economic growth, because there is very strong evidence that income inequality reduces economic growth, and that the worst income inequality is that not only does it cause poverty and um, reduce economic growth, but there's also sort of a whole host of other sort of health and social issues that come with that. So, you know, that's sort of our perspective. Um, but I, you know, understand the other perspective as well. Representative Walsh. I'm fascinated by your little box in the bottom right-hand corner here, and I'm trying to, first of all, I'm trying, ah, oh, thank it's you. Small really helps. <laughs> it's small enough. <laughs> to blow it up. Uh, I'm, I'm, what is weighted average threshold? What does that mean? It, they just look at it in terms of the share of families and that are in, this, um, in these uh, different categories. But bottom line is this is the poverty level for these different family sizes and family types. And so it varies. So you can see what the poverty threshold is. So the main chart on this page is really just looking at the poverty rate in Vermont over the last, I think it's 10 years. Um, but, but you know, these are the pro poverty levels. So, you know, for a family of four, it's 25,000. So you know, there's some other challenges how we establish those poverty levels and what that might look like and whether or not that's a reasonable measure <coughs> of um, poverty levels. But this is what the federal government uses. Well, my question is, what's the weighting? Oh, I don't know what it's, I could pull up the weights. What's base the methodology rate. there? So this Obviously, is just based on something is being given more. It's based on the share of families that are in those categories. There's a couple pieces to it, but I can pull the kind of formal definition of that weighting if you'd like to see it. Um, but this is the number that all of the federal programs use. This is therefore the number that Vermont translates into. And some of our benefit programs, you know, we might use 138% of poverty, we might use 200% of poverty, we might use 107%. Whatever that number is, it's based on these thresholds. It's calculated from these thresholds, and those are updated every year at the federal level. So that's all I say. So if you go to the, um, the main chart on this page, this is just the poverty level the poverty um, um, rate in Vermont, and you know, again, I think t we, oh, I think, you know, we've talked to some people at the census. I think the 2015 number <coughs> is an anomaly. I don't think it really dropped that much. I think, again, Vermont's a small sample size. Small sample sizes. There can be some quirks in the data at times. So really, I think you know, poverty is sort of relatively flat or trending upward. Um, and again. Um, so, so you know, over the long term, it's really not getting much better. Um, so the um, this weighted value, and uh, the the question is, the feds have not really adjusted that poverty number for what since the '60s or the late '60s or something to that effect. You know, so we end up having to correct or reweight, you know, at the state level or make mm -hmm. adjustments, you know, for our programs that we offer folks in order to try to capture, you know, the right uh, number of folks, you know, within that range. Um, has, has there been any talk about why? It seems kind of stupid, for lack of a better way to put it. So, so there, uh, so th things sometimes move slowly. I do think so. I think what you're talking about is that the definition of poverty was was you know they established in in the 60s, and it was based on again there were sort of archaic kind of ideas, which is you know somebody was home cooking meals, and your 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 food bill was based on somebody cooking those meals every day. Or you know, so there were some there's some archaic pieces to it. It has grown. They have adjusted it over time. They also in 2011 introduced the supplemental poverty measure, which is another way to look at it. And what that does is that accounts for, which is a good measure too. And I'm happy to um, send that information to the committee if they're interested. But if if you're interested, but um, what the supplemental poverty measure does is really adjust adjust particularly for regional differences, particularly in housing. So when you use the supplemental poverty measure, it's not so far off, but it's, um, it just gives you a little bit more nuance in terms of from region to region. So somewhere with a high cost of housing, for example, you'd see that more people would sort of be considered in poverty in those areas. But there's only two of the 50 states that actually have you know, a qualified 
poverty issue. Right. right. So, so I, I think that is an issue. I think that is part of why a lot of the programs use these percentages above mm -hmm. what the actual mm -hmm. poverty level is, because I think there is this acknowledgement that probably, that there are some, you know, some weaknesses in how that's officially measured. So, um, but this is part also part of what we looked at, and we'll get to these next slides where we look at, you know, Vermont does this. The Joint Fiscal Office does these calculations on the basic needs budget and what that basic needs budget looks like. And so we do a lot of analysis based on that. So looking more at what does it actually take to meet your basic needs, not just what these sort of official measures of poverty level are. But I, I do just want to point out a couple things about the poverty level, which is that there are certain groups um, for whom, if you could go to the next slide, please. The, the, um, there are certain groups for whom the poverty level is particularly worse, particular groups that particularly get left behind. And we know that it disproportionately affects uh, Vermonters of color. So this is Vermont-specific information. Again, these, you know, we have small sample sizes, so we have to use the five-year estimates just to kind of get some smoothing in that. Um, but we know that the rates are much worse for, for Vermonters of color. And so the difference, just so you know, that red chunk is the people in extreme poverty, which is considered 50%. Um, of the poverty level, which again is, pro is some of what Matt's referring to in terms of people who have very little income at all. Um, and so then the other... I'm sorry, one more question. And just, committee, I just want to point out we are <laughs> asking a lot of questions because we're very interested and we just, we do have other witnesses that are scheduled too, so I want to I want to respect Stephanie's time and, and our witnesses' time as well. So I'll, I'll, I'm going to condense okay. what I was going to say, which is I would like to see the statistical analysis you're presenting be a little more consistent because you've been you've contradicted yourself twice now. Okay. And I, I'd like you just to present the data consistently. Okay. 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 Thank you. Sure. So uh, the next slide is um, that single mothers also particularly have a, a particularly high rate of poverty. It's close to. Um, close to a quarter of single mothers, and that's been true for a long time, and it's particularly bad for those single mothers with children under five. Um, so, um, and we've sort of known this for a long time. I think it may, I don't think it's necessarily a surprise to people. We know that, you know, um, child care is expensive. We know that the costs and the schedules are difficult, particularly for single parents. Um, we also know that this per disproportionately affects single, single mothers over single fathers. Um, so, so the next slide is, is, this is what we were talking about. So this looks at the Joint Fiscal Office analysis. Um, so the, um, this idea of the basic needs budget. So what we did with this is we looked really, we, we looked at the census, census microdata, which really gives you essentially a profile of each person who answers the census. So you know it doesn't have any identifying detail, but it has sort of their, their number of children, their income level, their number of hours worked, sort of lots of detail. So when you kind of go into that, deep dive of those people, um, we really want to look at what kind, you know, how many families weren't meeting their basic needs, so not just looking at the poverty level, but looking at what is realistic in terms of living um, expenses. And so we only looked at, a, this isn't all families in Vermont, we just looked at, at the types, at a, a handful of family types that um, is addressed, that are addressed in the basic needs budget for the Joint Fiscal Office. So. They, they kind of break it out in these different categories. And so we stuck with those categories. And then we also um, narrowed the universe of, of this to people who are, in fact, working. So these are all working families who still can't meet the basic needs. So you know, no surprise, many, you know, two thirds of single parents with one ch child can't meet their basic needs. 80% of single parents with two children can't meet their basic needs. But what we found surprising about this is that even in families with two earners, that more than a third of them were not making enough to meet their basic needs. Um, so that was a little bit of a surprise uh, to us too. So on the next slide, I think this also explains why the demand for services is still well above where it was before the recession. So, um, so you know, the demand for three squares is still elevated. Um, on the next slide, we also see that there's more people in unaffordable housing. Um, than there were before, and unaffor unaffordable housing defined by HUD as you know spending 30 percent or more of your income on housing. Um, so a lot of these things we think of sort of as important measures of how Vermonters are doing, um, and from our perspective, a lot of these are moving in the wrong direction or they're stuck. So I think the question is, what are the policy changes we can make at the state level that would help turn this around? So again, that comes back. This comes back to minimum wage, and I think. 
um, one of the questions that came up in the study committee and sort of that we referenced, that I referenced earlier too, is this question of whether the minimum wage should in fact be a livable wage. And from, and our answer is unequivocally yes, that, you know, that that is sort of the point of the minimum wage is to ensure a livable wage and that we, by letting the buying power degrade over time, we've um, broken that link. So, um, so by any measure, the minimum wage, the buying power of the minimum wage has decreased. So if you look at it compared to economic growth, as Matt mentioned, compared to pr productivity, when you look at it compared to median wages, high wages, um, or just looking at the growth in some of the big ticket items like child care and the cost of housing, the buying power of the minimum wage has shrunk. Um, so for example, on the next slide, um, in 1980, if you worked a part-time minimum wage, you could pay for the cost of UVM. And in 2016, in order to be able to do that, you'd have to work 56 hours a week uh, to pay for the cost of tu a tuition room and board at UVM, which would leave you pretty much no time to go to class. Um, so, and then the, the next slide is, is looking at this comparison of the livable wage. And again, this is the livable wage as defined by the Joint Fiscal Office. That gap is not <coughs> shrinking. So even though we've, it's gotten a little closer, um, in these lat most recent uh, increases, it's actually not really shrinking that gap. So the question is, can we shrink that gap, and what would that look like? Um, so, so those two things aren't getting closer together. And then on the next slide, um, so this is the basic needs. Again, this is the basic needs, and we just want to point out, when we talk about a livable wage, we're talking about what a single person in shared housing needs. Obviously, there's a whole lot of you need, you need a whole lot more if you've got kids, if you're a family with kids, if you're a single parent with kids. You know, what you need to meet your basic needs is significantly higher. So I'm just, I, I acknowledge that, you know, we're talking about minimum wage here. Obviously, there's a whole other set of policies that we look at to try and address every family kind of being able to meet their basic needs. And so there's a whole package of that. There's child care assistance. There's earned income tax credit. There's Dr. Dinosaur, there's all these other things that we do to ensure that families of all sizes are able to make ends meet and get what they need. Um, so, so we know that the minimum wage doesn't buy what it used to. It disproportionately affects uh, certain groups. We know that there's more women. We know that there's more people of color that are earning minimum wage. Um, and, it's, and it's not even close to, to meeting the basic needs for individuals, let alone families. Um, so any step, I think, toward narrowing that gap would make a big difference. And of course, timing matters. So the timing of this is significant. So I, you know, I know that what's in front of you is 2024, $15 by 2024. When we kind of, when we deflate it back to 2018 um, and 2016, we see that you know, a $15 minimum wage by 2020 or 2022 would have meant a livable wage in 2016. So if the goal is a livable wage, you know, I think 2024 was close. Um, but the further out you go, the less likely you are to be closing that gap between the livable wage and the minimum wage. Um, so just in, you know, in conclusion, I think the points that you know, I was trying to hit were that income inequality is getting worse and that that's a problem. And that a lot of, it is di a lot of that inequality is driven not just by the big gains that we're seeing at the top, but also by the stagnation of the wages at the bottom. So while, as Matt said, we can't always do a lot about sort of those broader economic forces, um, this one is something that we could do something about, and that if we do in fact raise the minimum wage to a livable wage, um, we're starting to push back against those forces driving the inequality. And that from our perspective, we really need to start with this idea that addressing the needs of workers and families um, is the way to a stronger economy and not the other way around. One last question, Please. For, for me anyway. Um, mm -hmm. I like uh, the thing about the the weighted average salaries and the things that I like to, to put a different number on, $15 an hour, and I always use 40 hours as, as the easy math. Is that accurate anymore? I mean, we just heard from that barrel that the average hour is 34 hours. Should we be using, you know, when we when we try to compute what $15 an hour at 33 or 34 hours a week, is that a truer number of what's going on in Vermont, or is it is it, 40 hours of work, no matter what the jobs are, that gets to the salary. I, I think, you know, we use 40 hours as the default for what's considered full, full time. But we're taking, the, the wages that we're taking into consideration include full time jobs. We're just trying to annualize them all so that they're all looking across the same standard, even if not all of those jobs are full time jobs. So some of this is just the way that we compare it, and that we're not actually trying to say 
this is the average number of hours people are working. We're saying if you work 40 hours, this is what you would get in X, at X level. If you work 40 hours at this, you know, this is how those pieces compare. So, you know, I'm not sure it, it the way that we do this analysis, I'm not sure that we need to be that specific about what the average number of hours are. But I do think, you know, and I've had, we've had a lot of conversations um, about the number of hours and about some of the volatility and scheduling that people, particularly people who are working part time face, particularly in retail. Um, you know, and, and those are those are real issues. Now, whether or not that's a minimum wage issue, there are real issues in terms of sort of the last minute scheduling and the volatile schedules, which do, which is part of what goes to this issue of people not being able to have a job because if they don't have predictable childcare or you know a lot of these minimum wage jobs, you know you're working retail hours, you're working restaurant hours, and so you know it, it can be really hard to predict. So you know that's something to take into account. But what we're trying to do is just standardize the numbers that we're looking at. So we use this, the default of 40 hours. Uh, Representative Christine, uh, to continue on uh, uh, Representative Stevens' uh, 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 tack around the uh, the 40 hour uh, piece. Uh, you know, I do apologize for being late, but I was actually uh, doing a constituent piece, and it was around this <laughs> particular issue. Uh, and you know, he and his he and his wife, I think, combined work what they call um, three part time, near full time jobs, and they're just barely able to kind of keep all of the pieces together. Mm -hmm. um, and what I've noticed in talking to him and a few other folks, you know, is, is that it seems that there's more of a trend to keeping a lot of regular folks at that 30 hour range, mm -hmm. you know, 32. Mm -hmm. um, and what it does is it obviously is reduces the amount of overtime that needs to be you know, covered, uh, but it doesn't give a lot of uh, uh, budgeting power, let's say, mm -hmm. to the average, you know, person. Mm -hmm. Has that trend, you know, like, like Representative Stevens has been saying, has that been showing up in your research? So, there's definitely some... Absolutely. So, I mean, I mean, I think you know, Vermont has um, a lot of small businesses. You know, we still have some big employers. We have Walmart. We have, you know, so you see some of this. Um, I mean, there's definitely incentive to keep part-time jobs part-time if possible, right? There's definitely incentive of that. There's definitely, you know, movement toward reducing hours. Um, you know, I think, and I and I think the volatility in scheduling is also a problem for for people just from the planning perspective, from the perspective of childcare or whatever else is. Is necessary. Um, so, so you know, I think when whenever you look at the when you look at the body of minimum wage research, they're trying to take into account both the loss of hours and sort of what it might look like. And there's always going to be some adjustment in the, you know, there's all there's always adjustments in the labor market. And I would point out, you know, when we talk about job loss of 1,200 jobs or whatever that might look like, I, I don't want to you know diminish that, but I do. But there's always such churn in the job market. In any given year, we're losing 20,000 jobs and gaining 20,000 jobs. Or we're losing 22,000 and, and gaining, and worse than the recession, we're losing 23 and gaining 18, or whatever that might look like. So there's all this churn happening. And that's true of businesses opening and closing as well. So you know, if we look at businesses opening and closing over the course of the recession, you can see we sort of have net gain in businesses opening pre-recession, now we're back there again, but during the recession it was tended to be a net loss of businesses, you know, closing, more businesses closing than are opening. So there's just, there's so many factors that are going into these things. I think most of the minimum wage research does try to look at whether people are losing hours and whether in fact, um, you know, sort of the low wage population on net in the aggregate is doing better or not. And the research is pretty clear on this pretty clear that on net it's better for that population to have minimum wage increases. So, you know, I, I think there, there are going to be some loss of hours, there's no question about that. There, you know, there are going to be businesses that, um, you know, there are going to be winners and losers. Um, but, but that on net it, it has a positive effect on the economy and particularly on the wage workers. 
Thank you so much. Thank you very lots much. Lots and lots of information for us to show. Thank you. Thanks. Ron, do we have any news on Tom Cadet? Um, we do not. Okay. Um, I'm going to jump ahead and say Becca Schrager. Thank you for waiting. Um, Um, good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to address the committee. Um, my name is Becca Schrader. I'm the Business Resource Manager for the Vermont Community Loan Fund, or VCLF. Um, the Vermont Community Loan Fund is a mission-driven, community-focused alternative lender. We make loans to small businesses, community organizations, and nonprofits, child care providers, and developers of affordable housing who may not qualify for loans from traditional lenders. We combine our loans with financial capability consulting and business advisory services to make sure our borrowers have access not only to capital, but also training in the knowledge and skills that are critical to running a successful business. <clears throat> VCLF's mission is to create opportunities that lead to healthy communities and financial stability for all Vermonters. Vermont's early care and learning system aligns with that mission in several ways um, that address economic development issues, and issues of social and economic justice. Um, to highlight just three of those, <coughs> the early care and learning system provides jobs, it facilitates labor market participation, and invests in our future workforce. To that end, VCLF has a dedicated lending program to finance startup and existing early care and learning businesses in Vermont for real estate purchase, construction, equipment, and working capital. In the year 2000, we identified a critical need for financing in this industry. Banks are hesitant to lend to early care and learning businesses, especially startups. The profit margins are razor thin. Owners rarely have much experience in business management, and collateral is tight. Many early care and learning providers mortgage their personal residences to finance their businesses, and even after many years, rarely have considerable assets to leverage for expansion or working capital when they look to serve more children, increase quality, or increase wages and benefits. <laughs> For over 15 years, we have financed childcare businesses ranging from registered homes with six children to licensed centers with over 150 children. In addition to providing access to capital for early care and learning programs, we offer business advisory services primarily around business and financial management to help early care and learning programs increase, increase quality and access as well as working to make early care and learning a viable professional choice. In advising early care and learning providers, we've learned a lot about the funding streams into these businesses and the careful and precarious balance many of them operate in. Juggling Child Care Financial Assistance Program, or CCFAP, subsidy payments and private pay tuition is just the beginning. Many also participate in the Federal Food Program, receive preschool tuition payments through Act 166 private public partnerships to provide universal pre-K. They apply for both government and private grants and even hold fundraisers. We can assure that no one is in the early care and learning business for the money, and these business owners would be the first to tell you that their employees should be compensated much more for the service they provide to children in their most critical years of development. However, they will also be the first to tell you that the families they serve are already stretched thin to pay tuition at current rates. The 100% subsidy rate is outdated, and even if brought up to current market, rate, market rates, would likely still fall short of the true cost of providing high-quality care, as calculated by Vermont's Blue Ribbon Commission on financing high-quality affordable child care. Families that receive partial or even full subsidy can rarely afford to pay the copay to make up the difference between their subsidy and the provider's full rate. Many providers elect to simply not charge for the difference, absorbing additional costs into their programs. The more children a provider cares for that receive subsidy, the larger the impact of this deficit, so that programs serving predominantly low and moderate income families are hit the hardest. One of our borrowers, a four-star program in Lindenville, recently made the difficult decision to close her infant and toddler rooms, the very age group where Vermont has the most critical need, as of the end of this month because she simply cannot make the numbers work. This will mean a loss of 12 childcare spaces and five jobs. She has always paid her entry-level workers at above minimum wage and for the last two years had raised entry-level pay in step with the rising minimum wage without rising, raising tuition rates. This year she was unable to absorb the additional cost without raising rates. Early care and learning business owners are caught in a tug of war between two groups of people they care about the most, the children and families they serve and their employees. 
Oftentimes, people fall into both categories, as one of the most valuable benefits early care and learning employers provide is discounted care for employees' children. They would love to pay their employees more, but they simply cannot. And while families that access early care and learning programs would presumably benefit from an increased minimum wage, the subsidy structure and benefit cliff mean that making more income does not necessarily mean that minimum wage earners would have more funds to pay higher tuition rates. While this bill partially addresses that issue, stronger language, while still non-binding, would communicate this legislature's acknowledgement of that importance. The financial stability of the early care and learning system depends upon a complex structure of several inputs. Pressing one lever without adjusting others could easily cause collapse. In tandem with consideration of raising the minimum wage, we would suggest investigation into other investments in the early care and learning infrastructure, such as public funding through increased subsidies, financial supports for early care and learning professionals to prepare for and grow professionally in the field, incentivizing employer funding and facilitation of child care, support for acquiring and renovating facilities, including permitting costs, as well as bond issues or other measures. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the testimony. We just had our, our lunch with our early childhood group a couple weeks ago. Yes. And um, from the Northeast Kingdom had several strong voices that right now, out of the goodness of their heart, they're taking care of a lot of children um, to help families, but really don't charge what they should because they're already on lower incomes, these families. Can you, you just mentioned Lindenville. Is, is this a permeated problem that is really throughout more than just my little area? Yes, I would say that that's something that we see um, statewide to to some extent, um, that uh, the borrowers that we work with, um, they often do not charge a copay to families receiving subsidy, whether it's 100% subsidy or partial subsidy. And one of the things that concerns us about that, particularly from a business management standpoint, so we're working with providers on um, you know, doing cost projections and cash flow management, um, looking at their financial statements, their profit and loss and balance sheets. Um, one of the things that we don't see when we look at their profit and loss is any accounting for that. So they are running at a break even or loss and they don't know why because they're not accounting for, there's no line item that says, you know, scholarships or, you know, whatever they want to call that. They're simply absorbing that cost and most of the time it ends up that the owner then is the one that's taking a hit on their wages. Mm -hmm. So it, it would seem that if you make that decision, you know, as you know, a business owner, that you would be able to uh, deduct that uh, that stipend that you're making, you know, an issue for, you know, if you're as a loss, you mean? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, if you're. It's part of the doing business, right? You know? And if you're making that strong a statement that you know I am going to operate my business, I'm going to do the best I can to operate it for a profit. But any loss that I attribute, you, know, you would think that you know, people would be adjusting for that. I think generally we see sort of a lack of sophistication in terms of business management skills for providers. So um, what they're doing is literally a labor of love. <laughs> and so um, that's where a lot of the training that we provide comes in and really seeing it as a business. Um, and so acknowledging that you know, if that's a choice that you're making, um, that should be then reflected in your finances. And that has ripple effects as well. So when we do the market rate survey, which um, I'm sure you've heard we're already behind the market rate um, as far as the subsidy goes. But even when providers are completing that market survey, when they are setting their prices, those prices aren't reflecting the true cost of care. They're reflecting what somebody down the street provides, what they're able to get from the subsidy, what they're able to you know, pay workers. And so the, even the market rate, I would say, is not a true market rate. And so it has that effect. And then... Um, you have the other effect of many providers not being able to make that business sustainable on its own. So they either have a spouse who makes enough money to subsidize that business or they have another business that subsidizes that business. 
um, and that's the only way that they're able to make the child care viable. Do you have information on the tenure of child care workers? Um, I would, and Let's Grow Kids might have that information. We don't, um, so we don't have a research or sort of data gathering arm um, independently or, you know, in-house. In um, so the data that we have is specific to our borrowers. We have a portfolio in the early care and learning of approximately 43 to 45 um, child care providers. And then, you know, we've obviously had folks that have gone through our um, program and pay their loans off. And so that's where we get our data. So most of our data is anecdotal. Um, but certainly uh, we know that one of the things that we hear from our borrowers is the difficulty in attracting and retaining um, qualified staff, particularly with the increased qualifications that came out in the last round of um, licensing regulations. Um, we do have one borrower who has been open for four years. She's had zero staff turnover. That's unheard of, really. I mean, she's, the, she's definitely the exception to the rule. Representative um, Thank you. Very interesting testimony. Can I request that you um, uh, get a copy of this to Ron for our records? Yes, absolutely. And, and I just ask that we're going to hear from like dozens of people. <laughs> so it would be good to no, have, Information um, overload. Yeah, yeah a yes. record of it. Definitely. What, we, what I can retain over three weeks. Is. <laughs> so the, the loan fund has been, uh, I mean, I've been aware of your work for many, many years in, in, in terms of the child care and supporting child care um, providers. And I guess what's always frustrating to me, and maybe this is a Let's Go Kids question, is you just said that it, a lot of people don't create a business model that reflects what it costs to run the business. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a hard time seeing child care providers pay even a minimum wage with all of their college degrees or qualifications. And yet, even forgetting the up to 200% sub people who receive subsidies, this is an incredibly expensive service that a parent or a family pays for, regardless of their income. And, and yet, these are some of the most underpaid people, are, you know, not arguably, they're underpaid for, for the work that they do. I see this huge canyon here of how do you solve, I mean, we're not going to solve it with raising or not raising the minimum wage. Right. And I think that's our basic argument, is that there are so many different levers that you can push. Um, minimum wage might be one of them, with the understanding that in this case, your employers are probably working at or honestly less than minimum wage themselves. Um, and that it's a blended funding stream that comes from both private pay and um, public funding. So it's really, so while we encourage and try to help providers see themselves as a business, it's not a business in a, in a traditional sense of the word um, in terms of you know the pricing structures and that sort of thing. So we try, we try to bridge that gap um, in some ways, but there, so the, the financing piece that we do also is part of that as well. So that's one of the startup barriers is a facility because you need to, um, obviously there are several you know, safety, um, requirements that are needed in a child care facility and a lot of times they're buying um, maybe to start a small center they're buying a residential home um, then they need to if they want to have a care on the second floor they have to put in a sprinkler system you're looking at twenty thousand dollars just at the outset um, permitting for traffic increased wastewater um, and water usage so those are other areas where there certainly could be I mean I've limited <laughs> what I'm talking about to the minimum wage issue, um, but we got lots of ideas. <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Ron, do we have a phone, a phone interview next? Uh, I think she's available at 11. Okay, um, so can we have Sarah Kenny come? Sorry. Am I reading that question? Yes, yeah, sorry. Sonia let me know that she was in a 
in a meeting until 11 and then getting on the road and could call in from there as a hands child free, care. Hands free. hands free. No, she's going to pull over, I think, actually. <laughs> yes, as a child care center director, she's juggling an awful lot today. So, um, Good morning. Thanks Good morning. for um, inviting me here. Um, I'm Sarah Kenny. I don't think I've actually been before this committee since I was in another job and you were in another room. So <laughs> it's nice to be here. Um, I work at Let's Grow Kids. As you may or may not know, we are a public awareness and engagement campaign committed to ensuring that all Vermont kids from birth to five have access to high quality, affordable early care and learning programs. Um, I'm not going to belabor the points that Becca made and that I think you'll probably hear a little bit more about from Sonia, who um, has a really unique perspective as a child care center director and also as the head of the Vermont Association for the Education of Young Children. So she works with centers all around the state. Um, but I really appreciate the opportunity to be here to talk to you today um, about this issue because I think that the, the early care and learning system really sits at the nexus of so many things in Vermont, and especially when we talk about workforce and economic issues. So our state, many people in our state literally would not work without access to child care. Um, and we also know that during the first five years of life, that that's when the most rapid brain development happens, right? So our child care providers are literally growing the brains of our future workforce. Um, the Harvard Center on the Developing Child talks about how their newest data is that the, the baby brain is growing one million new neural connections every second. So, which is mind blowing to me, um, but it's such a critical window for us to provide that really positive um, early learning and development for our youngest children to grow the future workforce and to make sure that our current workforce um, can be at work and have the comfort of knowing that their children are being well cared for and that their development is proceeding in those environments. Um, as you just heard from Becca, this is such an incredibly important sort of structure for our economy and our workforce, and yet it's one of the most taxed systems in our state, not in terms of taxes, but like burden systems in our state. Um, as you heard, the average child care worker in Vermont makes about $25,000 a year. Um, often, many, many workers on the, that's the average, right? So many are working at the minimum wage level. And I would argue that they're doing some of the most important work in our state. Um, and as Representative Stevens identified, there's this sort of canyon between families are paying way more than they can afford. Um, you've heard some talk about the Child Care Financial Assistance Program. There are families that are, um, you know, two, two parent, two kid families who are receiving support from the Child Care Financial Assistance Program and still paying up to 40% of their income on child care. Um, and that is a huge portion. You know, when I, when my son was born, I had been, I had knew, no, known all along in my life that I was going to have to start saving for my kid's college account, right? But it never even occurred to me that I would have to start saving before I had a child for his childcare. Um, but we never even found infant care for him, which is a situation that many families are in too. So I had a little bit of savings there, except that I wasn't working as much when he when we couldn't find infant care for him, right? And the more that I am in this role at Let's Grow Kids, the more I realize that this is such a common problem for so many Vermont families. Um, so we've been really grateful to be part of this conversation about the minimum wage um, because it really, as you heard from Becca, directly impacts child care providers and it, it also really directly impacts those families who are on the benefits cliff, as it were. So the Child Care Financial Assistance Program is one of those few components of our um, social service system where with this with a minimum wage increase as folks wage increases they actually lose more benefits in their child care than they gain in their wage increase so that's obviously a situation that nobody wants to be in and the summer study committee and the um, senate committees have talked a lot about um, and we really appreciate the conversation around how do we make sure that that doesn't happen for families um, I would agree with Becca that I think that the language that is put in, that the Senate put into S40 begins to get at that, but it does entirely rely on the availability of future appropriations. So I think it's wonderful to acknowledge in the bill that we need to address this um, issue and that we can't hurt families more than we help them um, with a minimum wage increase. And the language also references the sort of wage increase on um, the uh, wage impact on providers as well. Um, and I, I think that that's really important. And anything that you can do to strengthen to make sure that the money will actually be there to support those increases is, would, be, would definitely help the situation, I think, and help ease fears around the state of what the impact might be. 
um, on child care providers. Um, it's so it's 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 interesting. And Matt actually talked about sort of one of the things that we need to do is grow our population in Vermont, right? And we um, I've been astounded at how many businesses are really interested in talking with us at the Square Kids around how to solve the child care challenge in Vermont, because that's one of the first things that they hear when businesses are thinking about moving into Vermont, um, which surprised me. They want to know is the is the housing you know will my employees be able to find housing and will my employees be able to find child care? And so many businesses and chambers aren't able to say that they'll be able to find child care. We know our, our latest data is that um, when you look at the, the population of kids, so 70% of kids under the age of six in Vermont have all of their available parents in the labor force. So that means that over 70% of families in this state are likely looking for some form of child care. And for that universe of families, less than or more than 50% of those infants and toddlers don't have access to regulated care in their community. So we just don't have the child care slots that we need. So when we look at wanting to attract young families to the state and being able to support our workforce, we need to be able to grow this um, universe of available child care um, and not make it an even harder profession for people to sustain and to get into. Um, so anything that this committee can do in your work as we go along, too, to support the child care workers and families accessing child care would be really welcome. Um, as Becca mentioned, the Child Care Financial Assistance Program um, is currently about 10 years behind in terms of the level of um, reimbursement that we pay. So they pay families based on, they pay, you know, the provider on behalf of a family um, a subsidy to support their access to child care. The rates that they currently base that on are from 2008 to 2009. So that, as Becca mentioned, leaves a gap between um, what the state is willing to support you with and what the actual cost of care is. And that doesn't even really reflect the actual cost for the providers, it's just the actual cost that they're charging. So as Becca mentioned, some providers just take that cost on themselves, others pass along a copay to families, which is where we get families who are paying up to 40% of their income in spite of having state assistance. So we have a huge um, road ahead of us in terms of solving this problem, but it's so critical to the future of our workforce and to um, the future of our economy in Vermont. When it comes to child care centers that have uh, families that receive, or receive a subsidy, mm -hmm. What's, what is the, I mean, I don't know if it's an average percentage of their clients, of their kids who might be on subsidy. So, mm -hmm. you know, if they're getting underpaid for what percentage of their kids and who might be on full. That is a great question that I don't know the answer to off the top of my head. I'm sure we could find out. But, um, Reva Murphy, who's the um, commissioner, the deputy commissioner for the Child Development Division at DCF, is a terrific resource about all of this. Um, we could probably find out. Lots of, it's kind of all over. Yeah, are you hearing from her yeah. and the commissioner, yes. I presume? Um, that's a great question for her. I don't know off the top of my head. It's sort of all over the map. Some providers don't have any families who are on child care financial assistance. Others have, I've heard of some centers that are like 90% of their kids are receiving financial assistance. Right, we took similar testimony five years ago. Yeah. We contemplated this, this current one, and there were, there were some who testified that they didn't receive any at all. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, um, I think that the commissioner and deputy commissioner talk really eloquently, and hopefully we'll speak with you about this when they are here, but the, the underfunding of our child care financial assistance program means that, so even if you're receiving 100% of the subsidy, that's based on market rates from 10 years ago, right? But if, you if, you are, um, if your income is over 100% of the federal poverty level, which is still a very low income, you're not even getting 100% subsidy, you're getting a smaller level of subsidy. So for folks who are sort of right at that, you know, upper low income or lower middle income, right on the threshold of eligibility, they're only getting a 10% benefit from the state. And that 10% is definitely not enough to be able to afford childcare if you're in that income level. So there's actually a drop <laughs> off of people who are accessing the program um, because they just can't afford it, even with state support. Representative Smith. Oh, thank you. Uh, do you have a lot of young couples who, that already have a child looking for child care? Or do you have a lot of young couples that come to you and say, we want to have children, what can you provide? Um, what do you usually see more of? I would say it's both and, yeah. And we, just to be clear, we um, don't actually sort of line people up with child care. There are um, referral agencies in a lot of communities that do that, but we work closely with those referral agencies to just find out 
sort of where things are at. Um, I think it's both, and it's interesting to me that I'm increasingly hearing more stories, and it's really anecdotal, but I'm hearing many more stories from people who are even thinking about getting pregnant, or in many cases are thinking about having a second child or a third child, and are realizing that they can't afford to, the child care for a second child. I have so many friends who've actually left the workforce after having their second or third child, like really smart, amazing professionals who haven't, their income just didn't offset the cost of having another child, so they've had to leave the workforce. Um, and sometimes that's for five or six years. And we talk a lot about sort of the impact on women, especially um, professional women, and what that does in your career when you're forced to leave the workforce for a number of years. And there's this very scary calculator that's on a national website out there where you can actually plug in sort of the, you know, what your income was when you took your time off and how many years you took off to be home with your child. And it tells you exactly what your lifetime loss is in terms of your income and the social security and everything. And it's really, I did it, and it was really sad. <laughs> it's a little scary, yeah. Thanks, Senator yeah. Christian. Um, to uh, further uh, help the committee uh, with uh, Representative uh, uh, Smith's question around what Let's Grow Kids do, mm -hmm. um, can you share with us, sure. you know, that uh, the, your work. What we do, yeah, absolutely. So we are an initiative of the Permanent Fund for Vermont's Children, which is a nonprofit foundation. And the Permanent Fund has been around for a while and is really dedicated to um, the, our mission is making sure that all families have access to affordable, high quality child care by 2025, and then we go away. Um, so we have a lot of work to do in terms of sort of the <laughs> Let's Grow Kids arm is really taking all these stories that we hear from Vermonters and connecting people with each other and, um, and working on advocacy here in the building on these issues. Our partner initiative is called Vermont Birth to Five. They're the other sort of branch of the permanent fund. And they are, have been doing work for many years on improving the quality of child care. So they work directly with child care providers all around the state. And their new work starting um, just a couple months ago is really, the, the level of quality of care has really gone up in the state of Vermont, which is wonderful. But the capacity has gone down a little bit and continues to decline um, because of all the financial issues we've been talking about here. We lose a lot of child care providers who go to work in the K through 12 system because public education just pays much better and has much better benefits. Um, so they really shifted their work to looking at um, capacity. So part of our mission now in the work of Vermont Birth to Five is increasing the capacity of childcare slots around the state. And we have a goal of 500 new childcare slots every year. So that's another big part of the work that we're doing. Um, that helps the most. Thank you. Sarah, I'll ask you the same question I asked Becca with a little bit of variation. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, uh, information on uh, recruitment and retention of child care workers. Let me just, I, did, I texted my colleague while, when you asked Becca that question, and she texted me something about Vermont data, which I haven't had a chance to read yet, but let me see what she said. She said, nationally, there is high turnover among providers reaching about 30% nationally, which is largely attributed to low pay and benefits. benefits sorry. Um, Vermont Department of Labor has projected that between 2012 and 2022, so I think they did this projection in 2012, looking at the preceding 10 years, that almost 70% of child care positions would become available in Vermont due to turnover. So it's 70% annually? I think that's between, that's over that decade, between 2012 and 2022. So it's in the top occupations in the state with the highest number of openings on average per year. And that's not because new child care programs are opening, I don't think, I think it's because of high turnover. It's definitely something that we hear a lot about from child care providers. And you may have heard from folks in your communities that the new regulations around child care in the state, which came out last year, um, especially for home care providers, do require higher levels of certification and training and, um, and credentials in some cases. Um, and that's also creating a huge problem because if you're already working 60 hours a week for minimum wage, how on earth are you going to go back to school? Um, so Sonia can talk to you about a program that's got real promise in the state, which is the TEACH program, which is one of the things that we reference in our memo as one of the levers that we can pull to try to impact the system, which provides access to higher education, or even, even bachelor's degrees or apprenticeships for child care providers to help them um, get the credentials that they need. Representative Christie. Uh, my understanding in the approach by uh, the look to see uh, 
teach that uh, wasn't supported. It was not. That is okay. true. And, and, you know, I'm just throwing that out to mm -hmm. the universe. Yes. Because uh, as Here. valuable as it is, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, I have no right. There's no right or reason why we didn't do it. But. Thank you for that. We are definitely working with your colleagues on the Senate side around the appropriations bill as well, because there's also not, there wasn't any. There was you all you all did, and we are very grateful that there is a, a small additional appropriation to bring at least the federal poverty guidelines, the, the reimbursement rights up for the federal poverty guidelines for 2018. But there's no significant increase in terms of the um, amount of reimbursement that families will be getting um, to bring them up towards market rates. But we look forward to continuing to work with the legislature on this issue in the coming years. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your work. I'm happy to come back anytime. Thanks, yeah, thank you all. So, committee, we're going to have a phone interview with Sonia Raymond, um, and then we're going to take a short break because we've been sitting for a couple hours, and then we'll talk to um, Rebecca. Right, so I'm going to do this, just a little technical word. We have Representative Gonzalez on the phone. We can get two calls on that phone, but if I don't reach and I have to disconnect, then we lose her too. So I use my cell phone and uh, hopefully it all. Using your cell phone for Sonia. Yes. That's the plan. And who wouldn't answer a call from the 512 area code? I just texted her a ton of number calls. <laughs> Wrong one. That's tomorrow. Sorry about that. Hi, Sonia. You're uh, on speakerphone with the uh, committee. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for allowing me to speak this morning. I appreciate it. Um, my name is Sonia Raymond, and I am the owner of Apple Tree Learning Centers in Stowe, and I'm also the executive director for the Vermont Association for the Education of Young Children, which is a statewide organization. Um, that works with adults um, and others in the field of early childhood um, and around professional development. Um, I, again, appreciate this opportunity. I just wanted to uh, speak a little bit from my experience as an owner for the last 18 years of an early care and education program. Um, basically, it's a very unique business. <laughs> It's not like any other business um, in that we are basically providing a social service and a need for working parents. Um, the cost of providing our service basically falls directly on the backs of our families. And our business is needed by over 70% of Vermont families. And there's a scarcity at this point of regulated and high quality care. Even with our teachers in my program earning an average of $15.60 per hour, um, half basically of what their public school counterparts are making. Um, and this would basically be a person with a bachelor's and seven years experience. Um, the cost of our service is generally still between 13 and 40% of our family's income. And this basically depends whether or not they have one or two children uh, prior to any public pre-K funding or subsidy um, being applied. So our teachers, as I've stated, are pretty woefully underpaid, and I'd love to pay them much more, and I agree they deserve to be paid a much higher wage. However, in order for me to pay them more, I, that means that I need to raise tuition which as I mentioned before, falls directly on the backs of parents. To date, I have not raised tuition enough to 
to pay significantly more as both parents low and middle income are already stretched beyond their means. If the minimum wage is raised to $50 per hour over the next five years without some kind of additional investments to offset the impacts of early care and education in our system, the effects could be very difficult and devastating for the families and providers alike. Families that are on state subsidy would have a much larger copay. Um, they would not be able to afford this copay as many of them struggle to afford their current copays. Families who have no tuition assistance at all would basically be priced out of the market and forced to make some tough choices about choosing programs that are unregulated or lesser care or perhaps even pulling out of the workforce altogether. Some programs would be forced to close, um, particularly um, those serving infants and toddlers, <coughs> further adding to the severe shortage of care for that age group. And small centers and home providers with a large population of families that receive subsidy are going to be devastated as they generally are scholarshipping most of their families so that they can afford their care. And when I say scholarshipping, I mean they basically are not charging them the copay. So raising the minimum wage creates an upward wage pressure for these stretched child care businesses. We have a pay scale um, at Apple Tree based on the position held, their years of experience, and their credentials as well, much like you would have in a public school. And at my program, our lowest paid assistants, those with little or no college credit, have to, have to earn minimum wage. Therefore, there's an upward pressure to all the other steps in the pay scale. Based on my current number, which is 21 staff, and basically keeping all things equal, in order to pay the $15 minimum wage um, by the year 2024, I would need to raise tuition $8.84 per week per child annually from a full-time slot. We have 95 children a day. And this would mean a 3.5% increase for an additional $460 a year per child. And this increase wouldn't even take into account any other increase that would have to happen due to other overhead <coughs> increases, rent, insurance, etc. These average increases would mean an additional 2% increase, bringing the annual increase needed to 5.5%. All of this is basically unsustainable and potentially very difficult for families and early childhood programs unless this bill includes some language around offsetting the impact on families. Specifically, um, I'm speaking about including language to increase the market rates of child care payment assistance for families and to raise the eligibility guidelines to encompass families who sit on the edge of qualifying currently for assistance and are unable to currently afford childcare. The Senate bill includes this language, though it would not take effect without a state appropriation to offset the costs. I encourage this committee to pay really close attention to the appropriations in the future to be sure that those investments are made annually. Um, and I realize that this committee does not deal necessarily with workforce issues, and it's not within your purview of this particular S-40 bill, but there are other levers that could be considered to also assist programs in not having to raise their tuition as much. Things such as wages program, which is a wage enhancement program for those working in the field, or Teach Vermont, which is a program that <coughs> scholarships folks um, who need to attend college to attain degrees and credentials that they need to remain in the field. Loan forgiveness programs uh, for those attaining degrees and licenses in the field that cannot afford to work in the field after paying their loans. And also following the plan that's been outlined by the Blue Ribbon Commission on financing high quality affordable child care. <laughs> 
I know this committee is <laughs> very dedicated to protecting Vermonters, <laughs> um, particularly those in the workforce, and I'm really happy to come back any other time <laughs> to discuss any of the other initiatives, but I do thank you for your time and consideration today. Hi, so this is Representative Tom Stevens. Thank you so much for, for uh, joining us today. Um, do we have any questions for Sonia? I just had one quick one. Yeah, Representative Strong. Um, when you mentioned the earlier childhood facilities, um, toddler and babies having to close, do, do they have to charge more per child because it is more intensive care? In theory, yes. Um, and in my program, that's exactly what we do. So the ratios are much lower for infants and toddlers than they are for preschool age children. It's an incredibly expensive um, end of care. In my program, my infants and toddlers lose money, which is why I have two preschools which and an after-school program, which basically offsets that loss. Um, but a program could never survive just on infants and toddlers alone. It would probably be the death of them. Oh, thank you. That's the first time I've heard that. Thank you. So I mean, would you say that, that, that this industry is one of the few where, um, where uh, labor costs need to be increased rather than decreased? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear that last part. W would you say that the child care industry is just it, an industry where um, labor costs, the, the, the price of labor needs to increase in order for it to be sustainable? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely does. I mean, the reason that we have a high turnover rate, um, and I say we as a field, um, it's something that most programs struggle with, is because they struggle to um, pay at a rate, particularly when people have attained their bachelor's in license, which is something that folks need to do and have folks do if they're going to actually be public pre K partners. Um, you often um, run the risk of losing those folks to public schools because um, you can't pay them. <laughs> it's difficult to pay them what they should be paid, as well as the rest of your staff and, and the other age levels. It's just it's an absolute need. And so I'm not arguing that it's a need. I'm just concerned about doing it this way if we don't pull those other level levers I was talking about to be able to help parents to afford what we are going to have to increase to. Great. Thank you so much, Sonia. I appreciate your time. And um, if we need to delve into some of those other levers, as you call them, um, we'll be sure to call. All right. Thank you so much. Thanks. Have a good afternoon. Yeah. You too. Thanks, Sonia. Okay. So, committee, we have, um, do we want to take a five-minute break to stretch? Yeah. All right, committee, thank you for coming back in five-ish minutes. Um, pretty good, huh? Pretty good for legislator time. Um, welcome, Tom. Uh, thank you. It's been a while since you've testified. Do you mind if we introduce ourselves um, sure. to you? Um, Representative Tom Stevens from Waterbury. Helen Hansen from Mary Howard from Belton City. Ed Reed from Dayton. Tommy Walsh from Barry City. Heidi Sherman from Stuck. Coach Christie from Hartford. Okay. Strong from Albany. Fields from Bennington. <laughs> Thank and you. And Gonzalez is listening on the phone. Uh, and Representative Smith should be back um, within his five minute limit. <laughs> so uh, we've been taking testimony on S40, and uh, you know, you obviously, you did a lot of work on it and presented to the summer study committee. And you know, we'd just like you to, um, you know, start with a statement if you'd like, or fill us in on where you, you know, where you fell on on the research that you did. Sure. Um, we did uh, three analyses last year on variations that were brought up and proposed at different times about what might happen to minimum wages. Mm -hmm. And um, so those three memos are things that I sent to Ron, so if you want to reference and read through them, that's fine. We've also done probably another three or four analyses since 1999 when we did the first minimum wage analysis for the state. It was done 
with a, a summer subcommittee that really went deeply into it. Um, and uh, uh, it was the first time that there was an understanding that there would be benefits lost by people through minimum wage increases. And that had never been factored into any minimum wage analysis in the literature that was out there. And I think, you know, made a real difference in how we understand it and what we can do to truly benefit the people that you're trying to help, uh, which in some cases this was disadvantaging people because they were losing benefits faster than they were gaining income. So I really commend you for, you know, addressing that and considering it. Deb Brighton was a person, by the way, who did that analysis and, and has done it consistently over time. And it was a phenomenal amount of work. She had to go into each one of these benefit programs, federal and state, figure out all the cutoff points, calculate everybody's after-tax income or income for purposes of qualifying for these programs, and then seeing what would happen to their benefits. It was a monumental effort on her part and really contributed to the, to the uh, whole thing. There's, um, you know, a series of charts that, that we've done over the years, and you've probably seen these. I don't have to pull it up on that, but, you know, it just shows that you stack up all these benefits, you know, then those, and that's in-kind income for people. And then as wages go up, it shows, you know, depending on the family configuration, that your actual, you know, uh, the monetary value of what you're getting for those benefits can actually go down as your wage goes up. And that's not what we want to do. We want to incent people to work. And, uh, and also how taxes come into play, you know, so there are taxes that start to, way before you get to a livable income level, taxes start to pull away money also from what people have. So anyway, the, all those interactions are important to note. So we did um, a series of analyses that culminated in work in September and October for uh, the, the uh, subcommittee that was looking at this. And, um, and our final analysis is not one that matches perfectly with what's currently under consideration. So we don't have an analysis that pegs, you know, detailed numbers like we do for the other variants that we looked at. Uh, we looked at uh, $15 per hour in 2022, 1325 per hour in 2022, and 12 50 per hour in 2021, and those, those would be sort of stakes in the ground. So that then you could look at those impacts and say, all right, if we go a little faster or a little slower or something like that, then the impacts would be somewhere <laughs> within these ranges. But it, um, uh, that was the purpose of it. So uh, uh, Joyce Manchester and, and Deb Bright and people at Joint Fiscal have taken those analyses and, and you know, translated those into likely potential impacts for uh, what's been proposed in S40. And uh, those are the numbers that you know, you, you've probably seen. But they're, they're not in my documents, because we didn't do that work joint fiscal did. Uh, but uh, if there's any aspect of this um, you know, that you have questions about, I'd be happy to uh, just talk about it. We, we ran all the. Uh, analyses through a state economic model to try to quantify some of the potential impacts. Uh, it's not like something that you're you're talking about an event that's six years hence. You're using data that in some cases is four to six years old. You're you know there's there's a lot of you know there's a big time cap between that. A lot can change over that period of time. So it's not as you know, uh, uh, solid uh, uh, a basis as if you say what our revenue is going to look like next year or two years from now or something like that. So that's um, that's the nature of uh, of the analysis. But the major chips, the major <laughs> things that are likely to happen are 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 spelled out and, and quantified in that analysis. So uh, uh, that document, if um, it's up behind, it's up behind. So, okay, so that was a. a October 2nd uh, analysis, and uh, there are lots of charts and tables and things like that in that. The one thing I don't think that didn't make it into S40 uh, that was kind of trailing testimony to Senate Economic Development was a recommendation that there be 
analysis that follows up to study what the impacts actually are. So we've uh, uh, you know, done analysis in the past, but without the data to measure what really happens, you don't really know what's happened. And uh, with some recent changes in Washington State, uh, in the Seattle area, they mandated collection of information that allows you to look at hours worked in addition to the number of jobs and provides a basis for understanding what happens in the real world around this. And uh, so I had recommended doing something like that for Vermont so that we're not flying blind. This is a, a substantial minimum wage increase, so it's beyond the range of historical experience. And so having ways to measure what's happening is, is probably useful, uh, so that if it's uh, highly beneficial and not a lot of negative impact, you may choose to go faster on increases. And if you're seeing things that are negative, then you could say, uh, maybe it should be tempered, maybe it should be slowed down, or, or, or you know, there are costs that we didn't understand or, or realize. Uh, the work in Washington has not been conclusive, it hasn't been out long enough to really get an understanding of the impacts, but it's been, it, it, it's, it, it's been a useful set of metrics to try to understand uh, what happens when there's this kind of increase. The other thing is that we border a state with 29 bridges across it that uh, has a minimum wage at the federal level. So that's, uh, that's a New Hampshire, of course, and, um, and there's not any indication, at least from what I've heard in the current session, that there's going to be anything done in New Hampshire to adjust that. And, and that differential is something that, you know, that's a, that's a concern. There's a chart uh, on page six of this analysis that just shows you know, the differential with, with New Hampshire and if they don't change it, the sort of thing that, you know, that you could get. And it, it, that too is an opportunity to look at and study what changes and what, you know, we've now had a fairly persistent differential for a while. Uh, it used to be, you know, pretty much the same. That's a zero line at the bottom. Um, and then it started to depart, you know, at different periods where there's been a state increase that was above the federal, then the federal increases and that differential drops. But you can see it's sort of been, you know, climbing back up. And there should, it, you know, if there's some negative effects, they should start to show up and we should be able to analyze those. And there has not been uh, funding to do any uh, work like that. And I think even if it's sort of cursory work, that would be a useful adjunct to this is to be able to have some kind of a dashboard that says, you know, alert, something bad's happening or something good's happening. Uh, just some of the data we looked at, uh, uh, cursory analysis, the uh, New Hampshire Department of Labor ran some data for us and showed that uh, there was about 13% uh, of, of the uh, labor force, I think, as of uh, 2015 that was below Vermont's minimum wage. What was interesting is that about 70%, I think 68% of the people who were under the minimum wage were women. So there was a real gender split between who was getting a sub-Vermont minimum wage in New Hampshire. Uh, so things like that which are just of interest to, to you know, look at the data and start to say, well, you know, what's different? What's job growth look like in industries with high concentration of minimum wage workers? Now, there are, it's not like there's nothing else going on in the world. So, like, take the retail sector, where all the big box stores, you know, were being built on the other side of the Connecticut River. And so you see retail employment was going up there for a long time relative to Vermont. And all of a sudden, retail employment has dropped precipitously <coughs> in New Hampshire because of internet sales, not because of anything Vermont did. But it didn't drop in Vermont because the kind of retail stores that remained were real niche kind of either tourist-oriented or, or, you know, just, just uh, uh, fit in a different uh, uh, slot. So uh, it's not like the minimum wage is controlling everything, but we can look at some of the factors and just observe things that are going on. So we had recommended that the Department of Labor collect data on hours and, uh, and also job counts that would allow us to monitor potential impacts that are occurring and also that uh, some analysis be done 
uh, over time looking at Vermont, New Hampshire. Um, so that's not in the legislation now, but was a recommendation and something you might want to consider. Isn't there information at the Department of Labor that shows at least Vermonters who work out of state where there's a number of um, you know, income tax filers but they can tell who works out of state? Oh, yeah, you can tell who works out of state and who from New Hampshire works in Vermont and that sort of thing. Right, and the other thing in, you know, I may be taking your thunder, just that idea that minimum wage, that there are a lot of those service industry jobs that are paying, m matching our minimum wage in the highly competitive Oh, sure, competitive and this is another markets. issue, is the prevailing wage is starting to get significant upward pressure. So, I mean, this is why Walmart announced, you know, uh, large increases in the minimum wage they're paying. This is out of the goodness of their heart. This is because the, in order to attract qualified workers, you have to pay more. And what they saw when they did that was part of what's called the efficiency wage theory is that their, their turnover dropped substantially, and they found it was actually a little bit more profitable to not have to retrain people and have quite so much turnover. So, so there's that, that's coming in at the same time. And actually, it's why, in some cases, um, minimum wage increases haven't been shown to have really high negative impacts, because quite often they lag the prevailing wage. So to the extent they're just catching up with a prevailing market wage, you wouldn't expect there to be a whole lot of impact. There are some people that get lost in that. You know, when I talked about the, the female workers in New Hampshire, you know, people that are not, you know, demanding wage increases as vociferously or as, um, you know, whatever, those will sort of not, you know, there, there won't be motivation for every employer to just automatically increase those wages just because they're increasing wages for new people that they have to hire and attract. Uh, Representative Christie had a, a question. I'm sorry. Uh, being that I represent a border community, yeah. um, what we noticed, you know, very quickly was as the Vermont minimum went up, it was matched if not exceeded on the other side of the river. Yeah. Because of the competitive nature of the market. You know, we have the lowest unemployment rate in the state in Hartford, in that area. Yeah. And so that being said, there's a demand for workforce, qualified workforce, and the only way that they could uh, maintain uh, their businesses was to meet that demand. Right, right. So that's side. a prevailing wage yeah. notion, and that's true. I mean, right now, we're seeing unemployment rates, both nationally and the state level, come very close to record lows, yeah. and that will create upward wage pressure, which, even though you'll hear a lot of employers wringing their hands about it, uh, this is what happens when there's scarcity in a commodity or a, an input to production. And it's also something that the, the, the lack of has been a real problem in the economy. And we talk about wages not going up for a very long time and real wages as well. Uh, you know, it's not that that's, you know, that's necessarily a good or a bad, but it's, uh, uh, it, it does mean that the negative impact from minimum wage, if the prevailing wage is already uh, above or close to that, that uh, it will be, the negative effects will be much lower. Um, but again, uh, you know, we'll be using projections. And if the economy overheats to the point that unemployment, you know, I mean, by adding deficit spending, which is what the tax cuts have done that were enacted in December, so that's, that's juicing up the economy uh, uh, by deficit spending when the economy is very close to uh, full output, you're likely to get more inflation, and part of that inflation will be through uh, wage pressures. They're not, it'll, it'll bring in people from the fringes of the labor force, and we're seeing that now. We're getting labor force growth, not because of natural population growth. We have the working age population actually declining uh, uh, in the state and flat nationally, but we're getting increases in our labor force because there are people that left the labor force that are coming back in. And so that's the first thing that happens. But when you hit the limits of that, uh, you then will have wage increases. You'll be you'll see businesses competing for 
uh, uh, the same people, and those businesses that can't afford to compete for them will go out of business. Either they, if they're competing with, say, cheap foreign labor or uh, the, a served market that's uh, uh, unable to afford price increases and the like, then they'll be going out of business, but those workers will be hired by some company that has a competitive advantage somewhere and is able to pay those wages. So did you just say, I'm sorry, did you say that, that there are people who are coming back into the labor force to fill up you know, the gaps that are from a 2.8% thing? Is this the, are these the people that are measured differently? Like we say that there's a 2.8% unemployment rate, but there's really a 12.2% or whatever the number is. Are those those people who stop looking for jobs that are coming back into the market? Yeah, there are about six different metrics for unemployment. So you you know the, the standard unemployment rate is you know called the U6, and it's sort of you know so it has certain measures that are you ask somebody are you looking or have you looked for work over a certain period of time and if the answer is yes then you're part of the labor force you want a job you're trying to get a job but you don't have one then you're unemployed but if you say no i haven't looked for work because it's impossible there's nothing out there or you know whatever then you're not counted as part of the uh, uh, unemployment rate because you're not in the labor force but then there are other metrics that say well are you discouraged because there's no potential work? Or are you doing this voluntarily? Or, you know, so there are other counts of the unemployment rate. And yes, that's what these other metrics, and some go below and some go above the standard unemployment rate, are all measures of labor market tightness. And there's no question on all of these, the market's tightening. And that's bringing more people who said, no, I'm not even looking for a job, into the point of saying, yeah, I'm, I'm now I am looking for a job because, you know, there there's some that really look interesting, and you know, at, at those wages, I'll, I'm willing to work. Uh, uh, generally, there are more, you know, pe people that are uh, more what are called marginally attached to the labor force. Either they don't have to work, or they, um, uh, you know, maybe uh, uh, have a criminal record or have, you know, a some history of drug abuse or something like that, they're harder to, to employ. So they wouldn't be the first employed, but at some point, people give them a chance and, and, and they're back in the labor force then. Uh, or older workers. Yeah. Yeah. Does that agree? I guess if I could lend something to that conversation, in the last couple of years, I've hired people who I never would have hired before. Yeah. And at one point, whatever percent who aren't working right now either don't want to work or are unemployable. And so I think that's, it's like you said, the margin. People that when it went from 3% to one point, whatever percent, they get a lot of people like that. Yeah, well, that's that's what's happening. What, what line of uh, business are you in? Property management. Property management, yeah. So you're not hiring at the very bottom. And retail. And retail, okay. So they so. need to have teeth. <laughs> yeah, certain presence, certain, yeah, okay. Well, so, you know, depending on the labor market you're drawing from, it can be looser or tighter or various things like that. But, you know, the market response to a shortage is to pay more. And so at, there's a market clearing price for every commodity, including labor, every input to production. And, you know, at, at some price, if you were to offer you know, $100,000 a year for people, you'd have people lined up, but they'd be going from other, you know, lower wage yeah. jobs to that. And so, you know, that, but that's the kind of competition that starts to occur. Right. And I, I, I think your point is well taken. It's, uh, it's happening now. Yes. And it's really starting to happen. Two things before we, it's, it's almost 10 of 12, and we go on for hours with yeah. you, and we want to. Yeah. Um, the question I have for a committee is, do you want to work over till 12, or can we, should we invite Tom back as soon as we can get him um, for further? And what's, what is your life like? I, I think there's a meeting with the money committee chairs at noon. Is that correct, Joyce? Is that noon that I'm, I need to be at? But other than that, I could, I could certainly come back sometime if there's follow-up or or, 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 or or what is your, well, we'll we can work with Ron. Or even later work with Ron, yeah. yeah. I don't think that's a long meeting, not more than an hour. Okay. So, we'll, so, we'll, so let's just, we'll stop at 12. 
and then um, we'll bring, I want to bring you back, or we all want to bring you back. Okay. Um, question that we had from earlier today, uh, the Department of Labor was here, Matt Barrowitz stated, made a statement about, um, we were talking about poverty rate, and there was an argument, just this discussion, does the minimum wage affect the poverty rate? And he made a, he made a statement where 50% of the people who are under the 100% poverty rate um, don't re don't file taxes with W twos. Um, I'm assuming they receive SSI or SSDI or wh whatever they different forms they may file. They don't work per se. Is, is that familiar to you at all? I haven't done a deep dive into the poverty stats and to you know who comprises that group and <coughs> exactly how they're affected by these sorts of things. So I I. You know, have to defer to Matt if he's got data on that. You know, that's what it is. If there are some specific questions around that you want to ask, we could chase them down. Join us yeah. and come back with. Well, it's just part of this whole workforce thing as well. I mean, just getting a bait beat on who the numbers, what the numbers in Vermont are of people who work, you know, and people who work in who don't work. Um, that go beyond just this, this this category that you just talked about. Yeah. Um, yeah, that would be interesting to to see more about that and um, understand that. Uh, uh, yeah, I I haven't seen the, those data though. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Yeah. There must be another question. Not that won't take a little time to answer. Well, hey, Tom, I've asked this of, of, of everybody. Um, this was a this was a question that that Representative Fields had last week. So, and you mentioned something about finding out the right data and what the what the outcomes are of actually doing a policy choice like raising minimum wage. And you said it's difficult to find out what happened in, in some of the some of the things that you. We're asking for or would recommend would be trying to find out that information, but you, we have a series of projections that you've done. Five years ago, there were a series of projections. Is there any worth or is there any credibility to like looking at what you projected five years ago versus what you project what you're projecting now and like what happened in between? So, um, so like we made a policy decision based on recommendations from all of our research uh -huh. that were projections. Yeah. And now we've you know, and now you're making new projections based on what exists. Is there any way to like correlate those two pieces of information to help us understand it differently? Well, had there been the kind of data collection that we're recommending now that would allow us to look at both hours worked and number of jobs in these sectors we would have been able to say something about that. Now, there are obviously lots of things that affect levels of employment. So what we're saying is relative to some baseline, there'll be a little bit less employment. And so that baseline, though, you know, was affected by the Great Recession. It's affected by, you know, zillions of other factors and things. So it's not like we had a point forecast that said, this is where we'll be. And if you do this, this is the variation. The better way to look at that is to say, let's look at control areas that have the same experience and those that have higher or lower minimum wages. That's why New Hampshire is such a good kind of comparable, is that it's nearby. It has a, you know, a lot of similar things affect it. And then, you know, but you have this wage differential. So, so what sort of things might we see that would you know, that would allow us to say, um, all right, you know, they benefited or they, or there was a cost. And that hasn't been done. That's just, that's a deeper dive into this part of it. It's not like there's a forecast that says, here's this number and here's where we're likely to be then. I mean, you can do that with revenues. We can say, how much did you forecast for revenues? And then what was it? And we do that every year. We go back and say, well, what was the variance? And at different points in time, what was it? And that's a, a track record. And you're either up, down, or on. You know, And uh, you, you don't have a comparable forecast for this, because you're doing a simulation that's assuming lots and lots of things. And you're not measuring at the level of granularity you'd have to 
to really know whether it was because of the minimum wage or something else that was affected. <coughs> but that's exactly why I think collecting those data are important to give us some idea of it. It's not as important either when the wage changes, and all our wage changes before have been relatively what might be considered modest, uh, you know, either at or a little bit behind prevailing wages. These are a, these are a much more substantial step up. And so we would expect to see uh, more pronounced impacts. But um, without having the mechanisms to, to register that, we can make some informed guesses, but we won't have the precision that otherwise would be the case. So I, I'd be hopeful that uh, at some time that that gets included as a part of it. You know, there's a, there's a lot of money at stake, and it's not terribly expensive to do this. And it's the sort of thing other states have done, and it's it's useful. The, the results will still be debated in different ways, but we'll have a set of core data that we can really look to that will inform what happened. Did hours go down? Did, in certain industries, they go down, down more than other industries? Are those industries of high concentration of minimum wage? Uh, what happened to the same kind of business on the other side of the Connecticut River at the same time when the only major change was minimum wage change or this sort of thing? You know, so we could we'd start to tease that out. Representative Christie. So uh, that's very helpful uh, and you know interesting. You know, just because of you know where I live. But uh, the other thing that uh, uh, came to mind. And I think we need to be very cognizant of as we formulate, you know, our, our piece of legislation from a policy perspective is to ensure those uh, uh, benchmark points that you had talked about uh, and then having some sort, you know, of a uh, relief valve uh, or, or some way of saying at that benchmark, if we spot that there's something going on, you had mentioned we need to have some sort of a circuit breaker, you know, in there, mm -hmm. or, or it would make sense for us to have uh, a way of saying, wait a minute, we got to put the brakes on here uh, because all of the data is indicating that if we don't, um, so so that that that. S something that's uh, you know <coughs> just meant that we need to be aware of, and that hopefully you'll be able to help us with possibly the policy component of that. Um, yeah, and I think that could go either way. Yeah. I mean, it, you could look at it and say, "Gee, there's hardly any effect. We could go a little faster." Yeah, yeah, or, right, right. "Whoa, put the brakes right. on." And there are some other states that have various mechanisms mm -hmm. for doing. Yeah. It. I think New yeah. York State did something like yeah. that. It, we did get that in some of the <coughs> initial testimony. So I'm just really concerned about that, uh, and I think that it might help, uh, you know, people feel a little more comfortable, mm -hmm. you know, if there are uh, safety valves and controls. And yeah, it's it's pretty far. I mean, going out mm -hmm. six years, yeah. things can change quite mm -hmm. a bit. So yeah, it's probably a good idea. Uh, good segue. You mentioned New York, of course. Were there other border issues that were? very much aware of that we heard about in our initial testimony. Um, with changes afoot in New York, upstate New York, uh, potential changes in Massachusetts, and a different structure in, in uh, the Quebec province in terms of, of wages, and particularly tipped wages. Um, and uh, can you comment on that in the analysis of, of those pieces? Yeah, I think you need to look at every surrounding jurisdiction. <laughs> But the commerce that takes place with New Hampshire is far more dominant than any other economic flows that occur with either of the other three bordering political jurisdictions. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, the presence of Lake Champlain and the, and the, the, you know, the, the fact that there are only a few places and ways to get across it uh, and uh, uh, the absence of very large population centers on on the other side of it uh, has has minimized those flows. If you look at journey to work data on how many people come and go to work between different states, it's massive between 
New Hampshire and Vermont, and it's really minimal between New York. So the, certainly the Bennington area and down there, you're getting, you know, flows both to Massachusetts and to New York. Um, and with Albany not too far away, there's a fair amount of commerce that flows that way. Uh, with Brattleboro, there's also uh, uh, Massachusetts effects, um, as well as New Hampshire. But New Hampshire is the biggest one. With international uh, uh, jurisdictions, the difficulty in traversing the border, and especially with security and all the rest, uh, has dampened some of what, what might otherwise be competitive uh, impacts that you would see. So there are other costs to trying to uh, uh, compete there, but it's not like that's to be ignored either. So all of those things are important and are important to monitor. Um, it would be great to be able to include some of that in any cross-border work, uh, but the biggest focus ought to be New Hampshire. But yeah, all of those matter. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, part one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so would you like me to come back today or what? Um, we have, today is, um, I'm assuming that the floor is going to be short-ish today. Um, we have something right after the floor, and then we have um, more testimony scheduled for this afternoon. If you want to check in with us, maybe around one o'clock. Okay. After your meeting with appropriations, and I mean, you're. I don't want to like pull you back and forth and back and forth, and then you're busy, you know. But tomorrow morning, we also have time available, um, probably after 10.30, between 10.30 and noon. Yeah, I'm not available tomorrow, but um, we can look at schedules, and I can work something out with Ron and see when next year is. Uh, yeah, yeah, because today may be harder. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I don't know if there are a lot of more questions, or if it's almost done, so maybe you want to I, I I, well, let's yeah. let's work on something. It should be early next week as well. But just yeah. to just to yeah, um, that's good. and and if people, if people want to make a list of questions, who things that come up, and then you want to like send that in advance, yeah. I can even yeah. you know work through that. So that's yeah. whatever you want. Oh, you got here. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> that's what you got right. Yeah. Or you'll maybe you'll figure yeah. them out or between the time. Yeah, 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 yeah. I get that. No, we'll get sucked into the vortex of, <laughs> of statistics. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully you can sort of. Use that to the extent it really helps and form mm -hmm. and shape things, yeah. but it's not the final mm -hmm. analysis on it. It's just one piece of guidance, piece of information, and you know, work with that with everything else. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.